Stop that. Stop that. Stop that. Yeah, I hear I'm chatting to the noise. Move too quick, can't stop for the talking. I hear I'm chatting with the Walking. Just too sharp with the prize. White girls let it tell me I'm awesome. Yeah, act like fire on the pond. If you wanna touch my please use caution. Call out the road to go. I'm out the cage, gotta let out the beast. Revolutionary guy, let out the streets. Locked in a cage, I'ma let out the let out the let out the let out the, let out the sheets. We came to the world, man, forget my peace. We take the west side, take on the east. I'ma put him in a cage, never let out the let out the let out the. I hear him chat to the noise. Move too quick, can't stop for the talking. I hear him chat with the boys. Not so tough, but man's keep walking, yeah. Just too sharp with the boys. Right there, let her tell me I'm awesome, yeah. Hot like fire on the pan. If you wanna touch my feet. Stop that. Stop that. Stop that. So, Stugatz, right before the microphones came on here, through soundproof glass, mm-hmm. I can hear Jessica's laughter as if she was drunk at a Las Vegas airport <laughs> on a Monday. She uh, would never do that. Uh, because uh, this place can be medicine. And I come here, for many of the people listening to this over the last year who know some of the details of my life, I come here more than ever in search of that laughter, in search of the silly. Please, dear God, let me talk about just sports because it feels like the world is falling apart. And it feels somehow in an America that I never thought I'd see more unsafe and, by extension, less free than it's ever felt because I could go to a parade and die or I could see football players consoling children at a parade instead of celebrating something that is in our silly playground. So, yesterday in Kansas City, you get 22 people hit by gunfire. One fatality, eight life-threatening injuries, nine of those 22 are children. And it's the apocalyptic scenario of, it's the sixth anniversary of Parkland, your neighborhood, 50 miles from here, when we said this is enough, you can't slaughter children. Adults can't be okay with that. A country can't be okay with that. America can't be okay with, we're worse at this than anybody. We can't protect our children because we say that our gun laws are about freedom and you can't have the freedom to go to a parade and know you're going to come home with your children safe. And so I ask you again, as we're laughing, Stugatz, in the sports playpen, when are we going to stop being okay with the slaughtering of kids and not turning it into a political conversation? What's the visual I have to present to you? Football players supposed to be celebrating at a parade consoling children doing a great job incidentally of consoling children because how the hell do you explain later in life the the scarred kids yeah i don't know what those three gunmen were doing what can possibly be the explanation that would make sense to anybody that it's okay to start shooting at a parade dan if you're searching for a tipping point i'm not certain there is a tipping point as to when people are going to take this seriously and actually instigate change rather than speak into microphones and yell about it Because, Dan, if Sandy Hook wasn't a tipping point, if Stoneman Douglas wasn't a tipping point, I don't know what is. All right, so I feel helpless with these microphones and this voice in a way that's super unusual because usually I feel like the words and the platform can mean something. So I'm just going to read the numbers to you and ask you again and again, wherever it is you sit in the political divide, are you okay with this, what I'm about to read? Are you okay with all of this? So Tuesday's the sixth anniversary of the massacre 50 miles from here. Killed 15 people, 14 of them teenagers, injured 17 more. So it's been like 2,000 days, and since then, according to the Gun Violence Archive, there have been 3,370 mass shootings in America. That's one and a half a day Mm -hmm. since Parkland. The past six years, since Parkland, guns in America have either killed or injured 5,355 children. Children! Ages 11 and under. Also, 25,000 between the ages of 12 and 17. That's 5,100 kids a year. How is America worse at this than everyone else? 
49th mass shooting this year, Stugatz, was yesterday. Yep. Lisa Lopez Galvin was a mother of two, a radio host, a Chiefs fan. And so now you've got 21 injured people, and a hospital said it was treating 12 patients, 11 of them children, between the ages of 6 and 15. And I have done this show long enough, Stugatz, to see Mike Ryan and Roy and Chris and Billy go from not having kids to having kids and now afraid when they take their kids out. Mike Ryan talking of the horror of when I go to a public place— since Las Vegas, basically. I'm looking, where are the exits? How do I shield my child? In a free and allegedly free America, how do I get, before I go to the celebration, let me put in, let me check the perimeter as a father and make sure I could get my child out of here. And I ask you as somebody who came in here heartbroken when it happened in your neighborhood, and we heard from the parents, Stugatz, that day, who had to spend these soul-killing hours of not knowing if their kid was okay. Is, there's a shooting. Social media's fast. It's not this fast. Is my kid still alive? Did I send my child to school? Is my child now coming home? I don't have that certainty anymore. I, I swear to you, as, I, as people get mad, Stugatz, that again and again this leaks into the stupid playpen of sports, I ask you, Am I supposed to ignore this today when it happens at a parade? Am I supposed to go to the usual laughter and the fun places? Because I know people want to escape here. I know they don't, they don't want the gun argument here, too. This is uh, pretty damning for the United States in that we can't really get anywhere in terms of gun control. And this is not a minority opinion in this country. And it happened in a state with some of the loosest gun uh, gun laws. Uh, a Fox News poll found that 87% of Americans support criminal background checks on all gun buyers. 81% support improving enforcement of existing gun laws. 80% support requiring mental health checks on gun buyers. There were plenty of good guys with guns at this parade. 800 police officers. Yes. Plenty of good guys with guns. And we're living in a country now. I'll, I'll, this is courtesy of Kevin Schroff. This is some of the locations of the most recent mass shootings in this country. This is places where you can't go live your normal free and American life. A bar, your home, your office, an airport, a temple, a church, a mosque, a concert, a hospital, a nightclub, a newsroom, a restaurant, a preschool, a synagogue, a yoga studio, a high school, a military base, a bowling alley, a street corner, a movie theater, a political event, middle school, college campus, elementary school. Now you can add a Super Bowl victory rally to the list. Yep. Where didn't he just name? Like, that's everywhere. everywhere. Yeah. That is not, by the way, uh, the first sports incident. It's the latest shooting. There were shots fired in downtown Denver following the championship win this summer. Ten were wounded. There were shots fired near the parking lot in the Texas uh, during the Texas Rangers parade. But, Dan, we do this all the time. No, we should cover these Every single time it happens. But the we word, but the, no, we can't do it. Stugatz, if it's happening one and a half times, Stugatz, if it's happening one and a half times per day, right. then we have to stop programming all the time to mention it. If it's happening one and a half times a day. The problem is people speaking into microphones is not having enough impact. But neither is what the people actually want by almost consensus in a divided yeah, America. Yeah, but the politicians don't want that okay. because they're taking money from the NRA, uh, okay, Dan, but, and that's the problem. But we can't, we can't be okay with that infringing on freedoms in America that way. We, the group of people listening to this who are close to consensus on, there is no sane explanation for what these three shooters were doing. It doesn't matter what it is that they say. Nobody's going to accept whatever the explanation is. And so it has to be harder for those three shooters to get guns in their hands, not easier. Not easier because they live in a state where people can just walk around with guns. 
Like, we are now going to have to do metal detectors at these things. We are going to have to be an America, Stugatz, that feels like it has vastly less freedom because you're going to have to use more surveillance. Like, you're going to have to make sure that the crazy people are not the ones with the guns. This wasn't one shooter, Stugatz. I know. God knows what the explanation for this is going to be, how three people planned and thought this was a good idea to just open fire on a parade. But like, were they, were they thinking of children? Was there any consideration about the fact that wherever it is that your insanity lies, it can't be the slaughtering of children. I don't think the gun laws are going to change. So to your earlier point, yes, it would take extreme security measures at every single event and every single place where people gather into big groups. Dan, yes, Stugatz. that's what it would take. It's not the land of the free. I, Mike, do we want to protect? This, no, but Stugatz, Do we want to protect Stugatz. our children? This is where no, the- I'm just I'm just highlighting that. Uh, the what other Amendment, option is there? The Second Amendment is usually about you know freedoms and, and and protecting a document that was written several generations ago for a um, bayonet. And that doesn't sound like freedom. What you're what you're what you're it, outlining? It's, it look, it sounds safer. Look, That's all I, I'm okay, saying. No, say, it, it, yeah, undeniable. Yeah. But this is how the freedom gets taken, Stugatz. Stugatz, I was at the airport flying to and from Las Vegas, and I had to, in order to remove the inconvenience of standing in the line with everybody else, I had to give the government and the airlines all of my information, my retinal scan, so that I can just get, in exchange for convenience, now the government and, and the airport has all of my information and giving that over felt like an invasion of freedom because our airports are now allegedly safer because we're checking everybody. Let me bring in Manny Oliver, okay? Because I'd like this to be um, something that is felt in a human way because it, I, if, if I feel helpless, I can't imagine how he feels as an activist here locally, Stugatz. He was on television yesterday. He lost his 17-year-old son when Parkland happened six years ago, and he was keeping Joaquin alive and what happened to him alive with his activism, where he goes to Washington and continues to fight for the memory of his son, saying this is not okay. And he's live on TV yesterday, and while he's live on TV talking about Parkland, the shooting happens. And so Manny's joining us now. Thank you, Manny. He's, uh, he's local. And as I said, Stugans came in here heartbroken, just broken. Six years ago, yeah. because it happened in his neighborhood, and this is even more personal. So, Manny, thank you for joining us. Thank you for making uh, the the time. I, I'm sorry that this is, again, the reason that somebody is talking to you. But what have the last six years been for you? And you're still out here making sure that you're not helpless, but you must feel so helpless that as you're on TV talking about your late son, another shooting happens in Kansas City. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. And uh, let me tell you something. This is the only reason why people talk to me. So don't feel bad about that. Uh, I always, I'm used to get that uh, intro, like, sorry for the occasion, but no, this is the occasion and it's permanent in my case. Uh, you just said it. We're, we're overlapping tragedies. Okay. I, I'm in DC with my wife and a group of young people, uh, trying to launch a, a campaign. That was yesterday. Um, honoring the legacy of my son and the other uh, victims from Parkland. And then suddenly, we, I thought that anything could somehow vanish my story because the media, you know, it's always moving with the political changes and electoral and everything that is happening on the political side. But I never thought, again, me not thinking enough, that another mass shooting could happen and, and, and actually move away the story that we were trying to tell for the sixth year in a row. Um, it's incredible. I, I'm not surprised. I, I, I got to tell you, I'm not surprised. Um, it's an American tradition. So this is the thing. We were all watching what we think is the most American tradition, and that was the Super Bowl. And guess what? This is the most American tradition. And now other people will be suffering what we suffered, and they will honor this day uh, February 14th, next year, in that location. So we're actually fighting for dates in here. I, I thought February 14th was mine, and I could talk about my kid. This is a reality, guys. And we can talk as long as we want, but it's bad. It's a terrible reality, and, and no one seems to care enough. 
there another shooting will happen and another show will go on and another guest will be talking to you. Well, you say no one cares enough, but you do, because this uh, it, the closer this gets to home, the scarier it gets. So you have started a platform. It's called The Shot Line. It uses AI to recreate the voices of victims who have been lost to gun violence. And you are rattling the cages of lawmakers. Are you having any success? Are you, are you winning in any way, or do you feel as helpless as everyone else does? No, I'm, I'm, I'm not allowed to feel helpless. Okay, I lost my son and I'm his dad. So <clears throat> I have to be here fighting uh, and the frustration is not an option. It happens, but not, not this time. So let me tell you about what we did yesterday. Um, very often we, we get an advice of call your representative. If you want things to happen, just call your representative. So we decided to put together voices of victims using um, artificial intelligence, very um, common today and um, polemic, and uh, we were putting voices of our loved ones. So, in other words, Joaquin will have the opportunity to call our representatives. And we did the same thing with other victims, of course, with the blessing of the families. Guess what? Yesterday, we had 20,000 calls. Close to 20,000 calls. Last time I checked, was 16,000 and something. Calling our representatives. These guys are receiving calls from Joaquin Oliver today. Not from me, not from Patricia. We tried. We went to their office. We had meetings. They ignore us. I was in the Oval Office with a president in front of me talking about this. And things did not happen. So now, now uh, it's time to, to hear the voices of those who are not here anymore. And I want to reach a thousand voices if possible. The platform allows more people to get involved. And uh, that's a small victory, you know. I cannot say that I have one solution for this, but I have a long fight, a long journey that is going to be packed with the small solutions. And at some point, they will need to give up because freedom is not what we saw yesterday. Freedom is going to a parade and enjoying, not kids being shot randomly because we want the freedom of owning arms and owning guns. That's not freedom at all. That's a lie. And we are the only nation that is believing that lie. Uh, Manny, I cannot possibly know your pain, obviously, and you say you cannot be helpless because hope cannot die, but uh, your son was 17 and he's been dead for six years and I don't see progress. Uh, do, do you? Like, I, I see people like you fighting with their heart, but I, I, and I, I feel them getting microphones, but I don't feel that translating into the activism, translating into action that is meaningful, that changes results. Because this needs to be constant, you know? Uh, gun violence is hitting us every day. So um, I'm, I'm hoping that the same way that Joaquin would have been with me watching the Super Bowl and celebrating uh, Travis Kelsey and everything, and you know, the whole party. I, I'm hoping that Travis gets behind a microphone and becomes constant in this fight. And 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 his girlfriend too. Like, why not? This is not something that you can show your face, say a few things, uh, even if you're an influencer, uh, just a, a powerful voice, which I'm not, but we need those powerful, powerful voices out there. Uh, if you just show one day, it's not going to work. You cannot wear an orange T-shirt one day and then uh, think that you did something to solve the problem. You did not. It's even worse because now you think you did something and you did nothing. So this is about getting out there every single day. It's hitting all of us, okay? It's not a blue or red thing. There's no distinction. It's hitting all of us. It's not the Latino or the American or the Asian. It's hitting all of us in every single space. There is no safe spot in here. What are we going to do? We're going to arm everyone. We're going to give that gift to the gun manufacturers. Now we need more guns on the parades. No one will go to a parade feeling the same way since yesterday. We all know that. So we need to hit the root of the problem. Travis, the whole team, uh, um, athletes in general. You know who was a great athlete? My son, Joaquin. Very athletic, not like me, just talking here, the old guy. No, very athletic, very into football and everything in general. He will love to see this reaction. 
So I'm doing my side, and I'm doing my side after losing my son. And I think, and I suggest that everyone does their side before losing a loved one. That will be way better than what I'm dealing with. Manny, when you say constant, what can people do uh, on a consistent uh, on a consistent basis and do constantly to help change to instigate change here? Well, number one and 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 the most important, don't ignore this problem. Don't underestimate this problem. Don't think that you are safe because you are not. Uh, it's not about carrying a gun or not. So you are part. You're a potential victim. All of us. Everyone in that room is a potential victim. You just don't know uh, when and where. That's it. As long as you're in the United States, you are in danger of being uh, hit by a bullet. And I'm giving you tools. I have specific answers for that. I'm not, I'm not uh, um, fighting for peace and love. No, I'm telling you. Go to right now, the shotline.org, and you can send a message to any representative. It's easy. It's two steps. You put your zip code, and it will tell you who's representing you. By the way, it, it's also interesting because some people don't even know who's representing them. So you will put your zip code, you, you will see these names, and send them a message from Joaquin, from Uzi, from Uvalde. That beautiful voice of a, of a nine-year-old kid telling you, can you please do something about this so no one else go through the same situation that we did? That's constancy. OK, leaders and politicians, you know what? They, they do what they can according to their negotiations and benefits. And so I, I, I'm trying to hope more on the people in general, people like you, uh, shows like yours and, of course, influencers. I want to see those players complaining about this on a daily basis. Uh, Manny, before, and thank you for your time, before you leave here, I don't know the entirety of your family history. I am just curious, based on your accent, though, if you're someone who thinks or ever thought at any point in his family's past that America would feel like this. Let me tell you what I thought. And and uh, I'm surprised that you uh, that you heard my accent. I thought it was getting better with my English. But well, let, me, let me tell you what I thought 20 years ago. I thought that my kid deserve a better future. We are from Venezuela. I thought that my kid should have chances that I, I, I was not seeing in my country. And for that reason, I left everything behind, me and my wife. We came all the way here, start from scratch, from zero. Very low uh, um, options of job and opportunities for us. But for the kids, we do this for the kids. This is the future. Now, now you're looking at the future that I was hoping for my kid. He's a, he's a legend. He's not here with me. He is a legend that is motivating me to fight against gun violence along with his mom. That, that was my dream, was not accomplished, but I'm not gonna go anywhere. I own that to Joaquin. So I'm here until this gets done. It has to be so odd to you to flee all sorts of horror and th this is your reality. Like this, this could not, this had to seem at one time in your life like something that was not possible in America. No, of course not. It was the land of opportunities. That's the, that's the tagline, right? Land of opportunities. Uh, the American dream. Well, I'm living an American nightmare. But it's not about me. It's not about how I feel. Honestly, and I'm being honest with you, I'm not trying to sound like a victim here. I am not a victim. Every time I feel bad, every time I feel sad, that is very often, I try to remember what happened to Joaquin that day, because I know details about that. The suffering, the fear, running away. The way that Joaquin was shot four times with an AR-15, that, that should be impactful to everybody. Not the campaign that we're putting out. That should be impactful. The way that that lady died uh, yesterday during the parade. Those kids that are, we don't even know if they will be able to survive right now. That's the pain. So however I feel today, it's irrelevant. I'm here, I'm talking to you, I can breathe, I'm having my coffee, and, and I'm going to continue doing this. Uh, Manny, thank you for your time. I will tell the audience again, it's a couple of easy steps. If you want to uh, feel slightly less helpless, the shotline.org is how it is that you can contact your lawmakers. Thank you, Manny. I appreciate the time.
Thank you. You have a great day. Thank you, man. This show, and I think Lucy can speak to this because she tried to clear the vibes in the room the other day when an argument broke out because the Super Bowl really was decided. We've got the audio now. We hear the Chiefs on the field. It really was decided by a coach evidently not knowing the rules. Mm, told you. And we argued about it and argued, uh, you know, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday and argued so much that Lucy arrived and tried to clear the vibes of the room and successfully did with breathing exercises and an assortment of Thing. Thank you. How do we clear the vibes now to try? Because this is, I, I've, Stugatz knows this better than any, anybody. Like the first couple of minutes of the show, just in terms of temperament, can derail me. And I don't want to spend four hours today in the emotional space that I imagine a lot of people will just fast forward through when they get to this later because they don't want this in their face. Why? Who would want this in their face? Who would want Chiefs players, drunk Chiefs players who were having a fun and funny celebration, as they always do, they're going to own those over the decade because of the quarterback they have, they were having a fun and funny celebration and we live at the beginning of a 2024 that's about to get violent and dangerous. Like, get used to this. Because it's not like it's going to get better this year. It's not like we're getting less divided. It's not like we're getting less armed. How do I change the mood to just talk about the Miami Heat's victory in Philadelphia last night? Because I don't know how to segue or transition into better vibes. You're putting a lot on Lucy. I mean, I know. That's well, a let, how about breathing heavy exercise? Stuff. Okay, but how, I need perhaps to, opening there. I need to. Ch- yeah, opening you could have on just said that. You not asking. Just been like, right, right. okay, well now the heat, and now it's my job to just clear this all. I think I'm making it worse. Honestly, Peter's so back. You Shame do your on thing. Anyone who doubted them. No easy way to transition. You know, you do that thing. That so, would have been great. That would have been polished. Yeah. You think? You think I should have led e- right here with just Perk thinks the Heat aren't getting out of the first round? There's you no think easy that's way a- to do this? But we will try to move on with our lives. Yep. Um, and again, we mm. will put out that information as the show goes on. You know, a little polish. Stugatz. You've done it before. During the break, had his head in his hands. Like, Stugatz doesn't feel human things. He's off to the next grift. Life is something it's that is... not it's, nice and... Yeah. Not true. Right. Stugatz felt something feel deeply... human things. I mean, how can you not? I'm a human being. <laughs> I know, but you're like... Okay. I got emotional. You're right. I was crying during that segment, and my heart breaks for him and breaks for any family... That has gone through this, of course. It's it's tough to listen to. I'll take your word for it that you were crying. I was looking at you. I didn't see. Tears. It didn't. I didn't see tears either. Uh, but I or think crocodile tears. I think tears. that I think that life, your life, yeah, maybe you can feel human things, but it is second on the metal stand to how do I get to the next grift. Uh, th- your <laughs> Stugat's like you gave him the credit for being emotional, he, and he's he like, took it "Oh shit, he I, had I, I lie cried, Dan. It. I was over here. He I had uh, to lie about I it. Weep. No, Jeez, I, no, I think uh, I think uh, part of the the brutal thing in this country is that um, you know occasionally Jesus, we, lying the, about my tears. <laughs> occasionally I mean, there will be tragedies. My tears. You didn't cry. No I, one my saw eyes you. Were stinging. No, I had. One, I, no, I mean, I, 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 we I, saw. Look, we'll just stop. Your head was in your hands, and you were emotional. You were emotional. You did not cry. It was an unnecessary lie. Continue, Mike. They're my tears. No, I'm good. Continue. I, I, I would just say that occasionally, look, this is a part of everyday American life, and I, I do think that um, it, it is perfectly human to not have it emotionally register the same way each time. That's just how life goes. Uh, occasionally, there'll be something, be it at an elementary school, high school, uh, a place that you see yourself at, um, that registers a little bit differently, I think, especially given Stu's proximity to Marjorie Stoneman Douglas and being that it was the anniversary of that, I, I can understand how this was triggering and, and traumatizing and, and certainly brings out a little bit more emotional uh, emotion than usual. Um, advocacy is important. Um, I, I t- kind of, when we workshop, how do we do today's show? And you see the guest list and you're like, yeah, this is, this is a drag. No one wants to do this, really. No one wants to stay there. But with the platform that we have, with the passionate audience that we have, I do think it's important to persist. Um, it, it, you can't stop. You can't be fatigued with something like this, especially when the majority of the nation, the vast majority of the nation, wants something done. Um, it can differ uh, what that something is across party lines. I think most people just want something. If you want more good guys with guns in school, if you think that's the answer, fine. That's 
in some way, shape, or form, that's progress. If you if you think that this is a mental health issue, fine. Let's do something there. If you think it goes far beyond that, fine. See if we can make some inroads there. I just get broken by it, um, but I do think that what you did in, in, in having that gentleman on was important, and we shouldn't stop. One of the many heartbreaking things about that conversation, Stugatz, because I don't know if you could get a lot more heartbreaking anywhere than losing a child. One, one day you're not thinking about it at all, and then he doesn't come home. And your American dream, you're spending the next six years advocating because the pain does not leave you because you didn't get a chance for goodbye. You didn't think that would be it. And for him to say, because to God, this feels like something out of the apocalypse, that he's on television talking about the six year anniversary and there's another shooting and he realizes now I'm going to have to fight for this date. My son is going to get erased by the time that it hit the Super Bowl celebration. Valentine's Day to him is not what it is to anybody else. Valentine's Day is the day he lost his son, his teenage son, a 17-year-old, without expecting that morning that he would ever lose his son. And now he's got to fight for that day on activism because there are more deaths. And when Mike Ryan says, Stugatz, that you have to keep doing this, I do believe a numbness sets in. I do believe we react to these differently each time, and the more they happen, the less the outrage is because the outrage isn't creating any difference in the results. So, so if it's happening one and a half times a day, like this one happened at a Super Bowl celebration, but if it had happened in a mall somewhere in, in, in Des Moines... Or, hell, Lucy got attacked the other day because it happened in Iowa, and she's just like, this is not okay. How can we be okay with this? But the outrage nationally wasn't for Iowa the, the same that it is now for Kansas City because it happens at a celebration, and we were all like, wait a minute, this was a party. How can this be America? The, the numbers are going in a direction that at some point everyone's right. lives are going to be touched by this. Hell, our previous um, studio at the Clevelander, there was a shooting at where panicked um um, hotel visitors ran into our studio by the dozens seeking refuge. This um, this is now a part of um, everyday American life where you put yourself in the shoes of the victims and understand that the reason why it hasn't happened to you is now feeling more like a luck of the draw rather than anything else. We won't do this every day, Dan. We won't. We won't do this in an hour. We won't do it in three hours. In another day, something else is going to happen elsewhere, and we'll, and we'll forget about the one that just happened yesterday. That's, that's the cycle. That's the rinse and repeat cycle. Manny will be there doing it every single day. We, Dan, I'm sorry. I'm not being critical of you. I'm just talking about I'm, the media I'm, in general. I'm, we do this, I'm, we react I'm, to it, and then we move I, on with I, our day. Okay. Manny will be there tomorrow. We so, won't. So, Stugatz. Uh, the, the part of this that I'm having some difficulty with for obvious reasons, okay? This year is going to be whatever side you're on politically, and there are nothing but taken sides now. This year is going to have more danger and volatility in it than any we've seen, and in the divisions, you've got more and more people armed and more and more people arguing about people being armed. Further radicalized and, and set in their beliefs. Okay, but for the ra radicalized, three of them were at a parade yesterday thinking differently than everyone else at that parade. The radicalized, willing to give up whatever remains of their freedom to try and run away from 800 police officers because they thought they were doing something yesterday because that radicalization in whatever the echo chambers are, whoever was reaching them was reaching them enough. I think we can say this without knowing what these... These, uh, these madmen were doing, I think we can say this, whatever news and information they were getting wasn't pulling them back to be less radicalized. They made a choice to give up their lives yesterday for whatever it is they were fighting on behalf of, which is much different than the echo chamber I'm in and makes me feel unsafe as I'm running away from these people and people are running into our studio at the Clevelander. And I'm paying $1,000 a day for security because I'm scared. Because how can I not be scared? Because I'm having conversations for the first time with my wife of, 
Well, what happens? Do I need to get like rubber bullets in a gun? What am I going to do if I run up against somebody trying to take my life and I don't believe in guns? And I don't, I don't want to live in America where I have to have a gun to feel safer. I prefer to just feel safe. I don't want to have the politics argument with you about gun control. I don't want to talk to you about whether or not most of gun deaths are actually suicides instead of Chicago. Yeah, I got exhausted by the politi- uh, politi- politization. Politicization. Yeah, it's a tough one. I yeah. apologize. Yeah. I, I get exhausted by, by that because ultimately I just want more done. And uh, I don't think that that's a stupid retort when someone asks you, well, how do you solve it? Do more. More. What do you want done? What do you think the solution is? Cool. Let's do some of that. Let's just do more. Do more. But in a two-party system in this country, as uh, Sugat uh, highlighted earlier, right now you're incentivized to promise that something will happen. Whether now that's something that's going to happen may be good or bad and may bring about change or may not. And I think you know where the candidates stand on that. I am team do more with this. And I'm not on a losing team here. I'm not getting the results. But the process says 80% of this country is with me in do more. But 80% of this country, do you understand that this is the part about America that is really confounding to me as somebody who has believed in whatever the utopian ideals of America are supposed to be? It doesn't matter what the 80% wants. Well, no, it's not just that. It's that the 80%— One of the problems. It's, it is one of the problems, yeah. but it's I mean, not, look at abortion statistics, too. It's like, not just that, though. Yes, of course, the leadership isn't doing what the people want, and that is wrong. But the next step on that that mortifies me is that those 80% of people that have gotten to the point where they're saying, yeah, 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 slaughtering of children, that's not okay with me, is that 80% of those people feel unsafe in America yep. and should. Like, that's not that's not 75% of those people feel unsafe. All of those people are seeing children slaughtered in school, and the result of that is, can my child be slaughtered at school? And the answer is yes. And the answer is yes in America more than any, any other country. Like, more than any other country, you risk sending your kid to school and bloody photos. And six years later, you're in Washington creating AI of your son's voice because you want a lawmaker to keep his voice alive because his voice has to remain alive. Stugatz just spit at me. Just spit at me, not Mike Ryan. I did cry. Mm-hmm. Well, Mike wasn't here. I mean, but you just spit it at me. I didn't right. say that you weren't. Crying. I, saw, I saw some emotion. I, I didn't emotion. see tears from where I'm sitting, but eyes were stinging. Okay, yeah. uh, that's, a, that's a little different. Yeah. yeah, no way to transition. I mean, you just admitted it. Your in words a, in a way that's not awkward, but I'm going to try to transition. There you go. That's, that's all you had down. to do last segment. That Bro. was a lot better than yeah. trying to drag me into yeah. it. Why would Stugatz, when he's emotional, lie about crying if we're already saying he's obviously you're get, you're, emotional? You're repeating the same mistakes. Right. You're, it's you starting the on. exact right. same way. Yes. Right. We didn't have to do I'll yoga. I'll tell you why. Because I mean, my transitional crutch has always been. I'm surprised me. more people haven't noticed this. Just <laughs> ripping Stugatz's no, scam. We've noticed. Uh, let's, uh, for those viewing on DraftKings Network and on our YouTube, we should throw up on the, uh, on the lower third graphic where you can get involved. Um, with the um, what was the website again? The shotline.org. So let's make sure that that messaging is there and we will do our best to move on. Yesterday, uh, we did not do this in the local hour, so we will do it now uh, because uh, what is happening with the Miami Heat is interesting. Uh, Greg Cody has become Stugatz. He is writing the column in the newspaper uh, that this is this might be Spoh's best coaching job yet. <laughs> he did not. I texted him, like, kind of making fun of that, and he did not like that. He's A like, truly terrible did column. you read the column? And I'm like, no, actually, column. but the headline's funny. Uh, but also, Mike Ryan has become Stugatz. The Heat are turning us all into Stugatz. Mike Ryan has come in here uh, yelling and screaming, how dare anyone doubt this Heat team as yep. they go into Philadelphia. They beat Philadelphia without Joel Embiid. Mike Ryan, nothing will get Mike Ryan more excited than being able to make fun of what frauds those Sixers yeah, are. Yeah, they beat uh, the Philadelphia 76ers without Jimmy Butler or a point guard, really. Um, so, yeah, Joel Embiid wasn't there. But that's day two of a back-to-back in which they just took out Milwaukee and the Philadelphia 76ers. Both games without Jimmy. Yeah, I'm yeah. really getting sick and tired of people doubting this Miami Heat team. Only I 
am allowed to doubt this Miami Heat team. Oh boy. And you know where this season turned. Every single one of you, deep down, even Ryan Cortez, they know where this season turned. And it was when Terry Rozier got hurt. And again, I just want to just reinforce you got to stack these wins before he comes back. <laughs> Stugatz, uh, this is what I will say about the Heat without too much over-analysis of a team that has been weird this year. Losing at Memf- losing against Memphis at home is the worst loss of the season. They are not very good when all of their guys are healthy. This is a weird thing to say. That's odd, yeah. It's, it's super yes. weird. Right. Duncan Robinson clearly needs to start for this team. He spaces the floor. Like, he clearly and obviously needs to start for this team. Jimmy off the bench? Not Jimmy. Hero uh, off the I bench. I really like this, Joe. Uh, I like him. He's a good player. And he's smart defensively, too, in terms of buying into a team defensive concept. And he was not that uh, as a raw product being drafted. I told you two years ago they think he's Gallinari. They think his ceiling is Gallinari. By the way, we might actually sign Gallinari, too. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, and we, we, can have finally, we we got to finally get that one. Oh, no. Danilo. They're, they're, yeah, they're, the you have two kid. Gallinari's, do you yeah. have one, though? You know what's better than one Gallinari? <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, on the hierarchy of, like, missed whales for Pat Riley, it's Kevin Durant and then Danilo Gallinari. We've been pursuing this through several leg injuries. <laughs> I, I will tell you because I know that uh, there is no way for me to get Lucy and Jessica involved in Miami Heat. Talk. Oh, I can talk about the Heat, Dan. I I want the Heat to go on a little run here. It's not fun if they yeah. lose when the expectations are bad. We yeah. need to get everyone in Miami. We need to get Mike Ryan on the bandwagon, Cortez cussing out people on Boston radio. We need to get everyone excited so that when they lose after that, it is even funnier <laughs> for all the haters. Yeah, what Jess said. Yeah, that's all I got. Yeah, ditto. I, but it's it's perfect. It's lining up perfectly because if they yes, lose. Yes, it is. <laughs> well, but, like, I mean, how sad can you be? Ooh, we were an eight seed. We're, we're not actually that good. It's perfect house money right now. Pre-excuses. I love it. No, This it's is perfect. exactly what we need. Yeah, it's perfect because anyone with a rational basketball brain can't look at this Miami Heat team and say, yeah, they're, they're good. Yeah, no. this is an Eastern no, Conference no, champions, and yet they – They're there in the conversation every year. Here's the problem with everything that you're saying. Because Perk, Kendrick Perkins, hired by ESPN to do what I'm about to say, which is say that the Miami Heat have to part ways with Jimmy Butler and that the Miami Heat will not make it out of the first round in the Eastern Conference. The thing that's great about him saying that is that we could head into the playoffs with him being exactly right. And last year... The same was true. And they made it all the way to the finals. And so we will be arguing about this, expecting Jimmy to be maximum Jimmy in the playoff because Kendrick Perkins actually had to have this conversation with himself on the air. This is how it happened. He's like, I'll tell you why it is that they have to get rid of uh, Jimmy Butler. It's because they don't have a Mahomes. I know that Jimmy Butler is Mahomes in the postseason, but they don't have a Mahomes. <laughs> but he's coming. I mean, <laughs> but he's not here now because it's not the postseason. But I know in the postseason he will be Mahomes until the final few games when his legs fall apart because whatever he's doing doesn't work for the yeah. final four games. And, and the whole trade Jimmy thing was like spoken from a place of fear, being that he's a Celtics guy. And not unlike myself, he will spin it into a win because whenever the Heat start doing those things, he also becomes oddly a Heat guy because of their style of play. It's a no-lose situation. Except when it all blows up because he's fighting Udonis Haslam on the sidelines during a game in the postseason that they're down 30 and it's all over because it's going to explode in our faces. Does that make it more like Travis Kelsey then? (laughs) Well, how about that? Can we get that sound real quick? Let's get this. I loved that I was first to this take before Travis Kelsey Stugatz. I actually made the argument for all the hysteria around Travis Kelsey uh, bumping his coach, I made the argument those two genuinely love each other. It's just ridiculous to hear that argument come out of Jason Kelsey by way of explanation because it's true that that happened only because those guys love each other, but it's a ridiculous thing to say. The broadcast showed you having a heated exchange with Coach Reed. <laughs> so heated. People are all over this. I mean, I get it. You cross the line. I think we can both agree on that. I can't get that fired up to the point where I'm bumping Coach and it's getting him off balance and stuff. I mean, let's be honest. The, the yelling in his face, too, is over the top. I think there's better ways to handle this. I love Coach Reed. Coach Reed knows how much I'd love to play for him. I'm not playing for anybody else but Big Red. If he calls it quits this year, I'm, I'm out there with him, man. He ain't calling it quits. Come on now. He's not. I immediately wish I would have took it back. Coach Reed actually came right up to me after that, and he just let him know, 
Hey, man, I love your passion. I got cameras on me all over the place, man. He's letting you know not, not to be like that. Just fired me up even more to go out there and get a f***ing victory for him, man. Big Red, sorry if I uh, caught you with that cheap shot, baby. But damn, I love winning with you. You got to have your head on a swivel because next time he gets fired up at you, he's coming hot at you. You know that. Oh, yeah, I deserve it. If he would have cold cocked me in the face right there, I would have just ate it and just been like, yeah, let's f- go. I'm not trying to make this situation acceptable, but this is what happens when you have highly motivated, passionate individuals. This doesn't happen if you and Andy aren't as close as you are. That's what nobody knows. The reason this happens is because you two love each other so much and respect each other so much that you feel open enough to have an interaction like this. It wasn't me mad at Coach Reed as as it looks. It was the frustration of our team not having success, turning the ball over, and me being on the sideline. Just on Not the sideline. Damn it. It was pleading with your head coach to let you go out there and win this mother. That's what it was. Me and you both know what it was. Andy knows what you mean to him and what he means to you. Are you taking credit for having the take about Travis Kelsey and Andy Reid's relationship before Travis Kelsey had the take? What I'm saying is that what He they, lives with it every day. What <laughs> they just said is totally true. And totally asinine. <laughs> the only reason that happens is because they love each other. It's the reason that they could survive it without being an explosion, although it helps that they won the game. Right. Do you think Travis listened to your take and then used it on his podcast? No, I'm and- just, I, what I was explaining to you yesterday is that when people love each other, they argue. And I don't understand why we make such a big deal about it when it happens in the volatile setting of a Super Bowl. Just let me pull a random headline from 2016. Stop mistaking Odell Beckham Jr.'s immaturity for passion. (laughs) Just pull that randomly. Mike, we can have the conversation about whether any of this would feel like this if Travis Kelsey were black. It just feels like a show I was doing in 2005, and I'm trying to improve the vibes around here today. I mean, the first two segments also felt like 2005, quite honestly. Breathe in, breathe out, in, out. I have an issue with the Big Red nickname while we're on this topic and everyone's fired up. They Ooh. say it's because he had red hair when he was younger, right? That's why they're calling no, him Big Red. Because red. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I think that's big. also part yeah. of it. Mm. Um, I, I read in an article, I was trying to find the origins, because to me, Big Red connotes Western Kentucky mascot. Obviously, he's like the one and only Big Red in my heart. Uh, the, he's, he's a big blob, Dan. He's a big kind of m- middle heavy... N- Bald Dan knows blob. blob. Yeah, um, he knows red. Okay, just making sure. He was staring at me like I had seven heads. Well, the the only reason I'm staring at you this way is because Big Red to me is the gum. When I think of Big Red, one hundred percent. I think yes. first of the gum, and yeah. uh, when I think of Big Red as he's calling him Big Red, I'm assuming it's because he looks like the Kool Aid Man, and I wouldn't recognize Andy Reid if he weren't either wearing a Hawaiian shirt or red. I would not. I think I'd recognize. Uh, yeah, same. Overrated gum, he's big, big red. Yeah. yeah. All, all I'm saying is he's big red Disagree. too. Hmm. Put it on the poll, please, Juju at Lebitard Show. Is big red an overrated gum? Because oh, I don't, yeah. I don't oh, agree with overrated. you. Yeah. Oh, no, it starts off great, red. like most gums. It's, it's got a kick right at the beginning. Sp- yeah, and then you know, well, five what's the best in, gum? The taste Go ahead. Goes what's away. the best gum? Bubble oh. is trash. What, that's just sugar. That's <laughs> just all like five gum because it lasts longer. Like you're thinking about the killer bees. Hmm. What is the gum that lasts the longest? Because gu- Bubblicious does not la- last Five. long either. Five, hmm. yeah, because it lasts longer. It's the one that lasts the longest of all of them? What is the uh, best of my, the gums? In my experience. Yeah, I think five is the best, but it's a little strong, so I usually split it in half, and I'll do half a little thing. And it lasts a pretty long time. Hmm. Chris Cody, you're a sugar expert. Do you have a favorite gum the nominee? tape. The bubblegum tape. Oh, that's so good. Chicklets. Yeah. Mm. Chicklets. Oh, they're so good, man. Chicklets. I love chicklets. Okay, wait a minute. I learned. No, you the... don't. Yes, I do. When is the last time you had chicklets? I don't know, five years ago. You love it so much you haven't had it in five years. Yeah. Does everything have Hard to, to find. be a, does everything have to be a lie? They're just like sex for me. Chicklets. What? Every five years. He loves years. it, but he hasn't done it in five <laughs> years. <laughs> Fruit stripe doesn't last long. I don't no. think any. I hate gum. Put it on the poll, please, Juju at Levitard Show. Would anyone say that Chicklets is the best oh. gum? Remember when Witty just admitted that he swallows gum? That was, was like wild. Yeah. Every thing, time, man. yeah. Mm. Man, that just stayed with me. How about bazooka? Strong. Thanks. 
Stugatz, are you o- only referencing gum from the 70s? Like, are you about to get the gum from baseball cards in a second? Like, are you only... Wow. Like, chew- Big League Chew? <laughs> That's not Big League Chew. That's totally different. I can see his confusion, though. Stugatz is only mentioning gums that were made in 1970. Hubba bubba. On second thought, I am alleging that I knew how much Travis Kelsey loved Andy Reid before Travis Kelsey knew how much he loved Andy Reid. And he, he totally stole your take. Yeah, well, he stole it, but he got to it late. I said it before he did. I got it out in public before. The asinine true take of that can only happen if real love is there. How about, did you guys enjoy Travis Kelsey pulling the Stugatz? When Stugatz is emotional, and you point out that he's emotional, he's got to one-up you by saying, and I cried, even though he didn't cry. Mm. Travis Kelsey has to be so apologetic that he goes over the top with a lie. I'm not merely sorry. If Andy Reid retired, I'd retire right next to him. Not if Patrick Mahomes didn't retire. Yep, I'm going to call BS on that as well. So (laughs) he clearly knows he's not retiring, so he feels safe saying that. If Andy Reid retired, Today, you think Kelsey is retiring Kelsey's tomorrow? Not, now not. he has to. <laughs> no, he doesn't. Can we go back to Monday, by the way, where Stugatz was still doing his "What if uh, the Andy Reid retires and they call Belichick or whatever?" And then, like five <laughs> seconds after he left the studio, Andy Reid said, "I'm not retiring." Wasn't that remotely was a great thing. timing. Wasn't remotely. You a and Mike Florio were the only two people that I saw <laughs> giving the take. Andy Reid. Check it out. He's going to retire this year. But one of the reasons Stugatz always wins, it's not just because every year only one person or one team wins and he has all 30 of the rest to criticize. That's not the only reason that he wins. The other reason that Stugatz wins is he got that one totally wrong. But he was way out in front of, hey, people, we need to – not let Shanahan skate on any of this. He Thank just fi- right. he just fired his defensive coordinator, and I thought that <laughs> defense was good. Two sides to every story, Dan. I get one side wrong, one side correct. Stugatz was out in front on no one can let Shanahan <laughs> rest with this decision that he's made. Two years ago, we quietly somehow had a Super Bowl decided because no one on the field could stand up straight because the sod was bad. So our measurement system was flawed by that. This year, the measurement system is flawed because we now have the audio of Chiefs players on the field confused. And the ref. They're really going to let Mahomes have the ball last? They're, 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 the re- there was a ref on audio saying they've chosen to give the ball to Mahomes. He was, he was playing for that coveted third possession. <laughs> but I mean. don't worry, Kyle definitely knew what was going on. That, nope. third, that third possession is important, Stugatz. You keep it's mocking that. It's not guaranteed. That, but it, it is. the third. Po- like there was you, no third so possession in down. the game. You know what's more important? Knowing what to do with your fourth down after knowing the game scenario yes. and having potentially one more down to either get in a, a first down or a score. How are we still doing this? I don't. There's no defending it. There's no defending Thank it. Thank you. It's, it's just Jessica, you botched it. what do you mean how are we still doing this when yesterday you rolled in here dying to talk about that? I know. I was also off Tuesday. I didn't realize you guys talked about it Tuesday. Now we're on day four, Dan. Okay. But I'm only on day three. So. Right. Okay. Well, this I'm is, on day two. This is one of the things that's happening. Why you want to talk about around yeah. here that uh, we I have to apologize to the audience. What's about. it what's it called when you do one of those songs like a row 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 and then the next person does row row that's us with our I overtime takes this week. Yeah. We're all starting at different points and oh, you're all uh, gently each other. down the stream and I'm so on <laughs> the row, row. Row 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 your boat gently row, down row, the stream. Dance on merrily merrily. Merrily merrily merrily. merrily, merrily, merrily. Life is merrily, but a dream. Merrily, merrily. Row, row, row your boat gently row, down row, the stream. No, Chris, you're doing the same merrily, one as Dan. Merrily, merrily, just merrily, merrily. Dan. Just life is but a dream. Merrily, merrily. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Row, 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 row merrily, 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 life is but a dream. This is why our timing is off, I will tell you, and I noticed it yesterday. So I was laughing with Stugatz about it before the show. Yesterday, I come in here broken by Vegas. You cannot be... I had forgotten that in my 20s, I remember, I I had a flashback to my 20s being with my friends in Vegas as the flight took off, the red eye from Vegas, and and saying to them, like bent over with my elbows on my knees as we took off, this is Las Vegas bending over and blowing us right out its ass. This is what's (laughs) happening. That was 30 years ago how I felt leaving Vegas. I come in here yesterday, and I'm not kidding you, with 
my blood saturated by ma margarita salt. Mm. I fell to my knees and I tossed the lob to Stugatz of LeBron wanted to be traded to Golden State. And the ball went flying out of bounds because Stugatz didn't know how to talk about LeBron, didn't have anything for me. You know what happened today? He comes in here and he's like, how does Golden State not get LeBron James? How does LeBron James not go to Golden State so that that could be the end of his career? 24 yeah. hours later, row, right. row, row your boat. Stugatz has something for me on LeBron. I could have used it on air. But this Vegas thing is like a disease. I mean, I have gotten over the flu quicker than I've gotten over Las Vegas. It just won't leave me. Yesterday I was yelling at Las Vegas, like, get out of me. It won't leave. I took a nap yesterday confused. that was so strong. I got oh, sleep paralysis on my couch. Really? Yes, it was terrifying. Huh. What is sleep paralysis? You, were you cramping up? When you're up? awake, but you can't move, but like you're you're kind of just like frozen in one spot. It's not good. On Monday, I went home and I went to sleep. I got home like relatively early, like in the two o'clock hour. I was like, all right, I got to pick my daughter up around by five. So I was like, I got a nap. I got a time for a nap here. I drool napped. Till like five thirty, I had to. I was like late to get my daughter. Love a drool nap. Oh, those drool naps are crazy. In put my it, house, we just call them naps. Put it on the poll, please, Juju at Levitar Show. Do you love a nap in which you drool? My sleep paralysis demon, by the way, was just two gots. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Jess, have you ever had a hangover for three days before? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is not as drunk. This is, nothing new. this is not. This is not as drunk as you have been. Then I have never been this overtired. I think for five days, though. <laughs> this is uh, this part not so much. Can you explain to me? Because I thought the Vegas flight that I had was bad, Stugatz. I've told you before. I don't know how the executive decisions get made on serving beans in a flying tube for five hours. <laughs> like you cannot do that because some people are rude. And they take advantage of the fact that you don't know who the farter is. And I don't know who those people are. Sorry. Those people are wildly, wildly inconsiderate. Stugatz thinks that he muffles those farts. He said he thinks he's got a technique to keep those under right his, into the cushion. Into the cushion, he does. Wah, I had to sit in first class. Wah, they serve me beans. By the way, you can pre-order in first class, and you can get a cheeseburger if you like. I mean, uh, first class farts smell different, though. I'm just telling you, these farts. I don't understand how they were serving beans in any any part of the plane. You Ooh, can't this serve beans. This fart pairs well with a Chianti. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I felt. <laughs> Flying for four hours. I felt like I had a face full of fart you in me know, for You know what hours. I had in coach? Someone just threw pretzels at my face. Do you call over the flight attendant to wave the air away from you? <laughs> I will tell you when I started flying first class, it was after flying coach from China with someone who was eating fish on the plane. Oh, I'm wow. like, I will never do this. 14 hours of, of fried fish. But the reason I bring it up is I thought – I thought I had a terrible flight from Vegas, and then Jessica, who's been following flights like no one in America, told me the story of a flight, Stugatz, in which, and I can't believe this is true, maggots were falling out of the overhead onto passengers because, was it a Delta flight? It was a Delta flight from uh Amsterdam to Detroit, maggots started falling out of the overhead bin onto people. Apparently, it was in a passenger's carry-on bag that had f rotten fish inside of it. Oh. How does that get how does it get through? Put it on the poll, please, Juju, at Lebetard Show. Do you expect <laughs> rotten fish to be kept off the plane by airport security? <laughs> You're blaming <laughs> you're blaming these security gates. Stugatz, I, mean, I can't it's get a piece of food. Stugatz, I, mean. I can't get a <laughs> bottle of cologne or a lotion on the plane. You can't allow a rotten fish on the plane. They're stopping me. I've got all sorts of clearances that I can get because the, oh, the government has all my information, and I and I can't get a bottle of lotion on the plane. <laughs> you can't allow a rotten fish on the plane. They actually ended up turning the flight around, and according to people, upon landing back in Amsterdam, the carry-on was placed into another bag and burned. <laughs> 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 like a bonfire, <laughs> they took it out back. It and they smells so gnarly. I mean, we are setting it on fire. Yeah. I the most unpleasant flight I have had in my life was 14 hours next to somebody who was pulling fried fish out of a bag, an exotic fried fish of some sort, and mm. and it can't. I mean, come on, Stugatz, do you like when? 
How often is fish being cooked in your house? Does it ever? Does fish is a problem under all Every circumstances? Every night, Lehman catches a snapper. Oh, he fillets yeah. that bad boy, fries it up. We eat it, but it's fresh and it smells delicious, Dano. It smells mm. good in the house. It, fish can smell bad even if it's fresh, but overhead maggot fish <laughs> on a tube, on a flying tube that now has to go back to Amsterdam. You are you're already headed from the Vegas equivalent internationally to Detroit, like. That's a bad flight. How far into the flight were they? Do you know? Two hours. Really? So they had to go back two hours to Amsterdam oh and burn the bag. Oh, my God. Because maggots are falling out of the sky. Hmm. Lucy, you want to clear the vibes in here? You want to clear the fish smell in here? You want to make it a little? Breathe in and don't smell fish. Hold it. Breathe out. One more time. Breathe in. And breathe out. I will improve the vibes here by pointing out to Lucy that Caitlin Clark is about to have the best day ever, which means that Lucy's about to have the best day ever because there's no one who makes her happier in the world than Caitlin Clark. <laughs> I hate that you only left me about a minute to talk about this, but that's okay. I'll bleed it into the next segment. I have zero problem doing that. Tonight, Caitlin will most likely break the all-time scoring record in women's college basketball. She is eight points away from being the all-time leading scorer. She's only like 200 or so points away from being the all-time scorer, men's or women's. This is, we're playing kind of a team that's Michigan, not, not doing their best right now. It should happen in the first quarter. It will be such a remarkable moment for women's basketball, for me personally, which is the most important part. Courtside seats are going for like $10,000 a pop. This is like one of the toughest tickets to get an event, like get into. I'm just... And this is going to be such a good day for me. It's going to be a great day for Caitlin. It's going to be a great day for everyone. Ah, I'm so excited. At 8 p.m. tonight, they play Michigan. You still have 45 seconds. I know. Well, I, I went through it really fast in my head because I looked at the clock and I was like, oh, my God. Well, I can't talk about everything that Caitlin means to me. Like, she's changed my life. She's changed all of our lives. She's changed women's basketball. She's changed college sports in general. Like, it's kind of tough because you sit here and you get to watch this run. And let me just tell you, I think the scoring, it's kind of getting to her head a little bit. The record, because she hasn't played her best the last few games. Kelsey Plum came out and was like, girl, when I had to do this, it was really tough. People didn't really think about, you know, what I was going through. So I'm happy that Caitlin's just going to get it over with tonight. She gets to do it in front of a home crowd. And she's going to be the all-time leading scorer. That's amazing. Everyone should be cheering right now. Everybody clap. Row, row, row your boat. Row, 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 row down, down the boat. street. I'm going to die for you, Caitlin. Merrily, 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 merrily. <laughs> Like Lucy said, Caitlin didn't have her best quarter on Sunday, and Kelsey Plum, who holds the record, actually tweeted at her before that and said, congratulations on the record and really your entire season. I appreciate what you do for the game. Much respect and love. See you at the next level, hopefully sooner than later. Caitlin proceeded to not score the eight points she needed to beat the record, and then Kelsey Plum quote tweeted and said, my bad, next game. <laughs> <laughs> and you got uh, that Mulkey saying that nobody on her team shoots 40 times a game. Actually, you know what? This is a good segue because there's something I've wanted to talk about here. Cheryl Swoops, women's basketball legend, has been starting a lot of beef with Iowa fans, Caitlin Clark fans coming out. This has made me so upset, but it was like a few weeks ago just come out and being like, you know, Caitlin's doing this in your fifth year. She's had all this extra time. She's got 40 shots a game. Just some of the same narrative we've heard from Kim Mulkey and other coaches around the country, which I don't understand why you hate Caitlin. I don't, she's amazing for the game. She's growing the game. She's amazing to watch. Caitlin's in her fourth year. She lost time because of COVID. She's doing this, like, if she had had that full season to start off her career, she would have done this faster. And more impressively, like, it's one of these things that's been weird to watch, like, and I know I'm so, so biased because I love her so much, but I'm like, how could anybody hate her? And it makes me so angry that people aren't rooting for her. She's amazing. You say it's weird to watch, and to me it's something I've gotten tired of over 30 years, where athletic greatness, the way that we cover it now, is so poisoned, contaminated, you got to have takes, that basically anyone who's doing anything great is going to be inundated with haters. Uh, look at what's happening all around Shannon Sharp and McAfee and who it is that gets mad about what's happening 
happening around Shannon Sharp and McAfee, how much criticism arrives in all sorts of forms in our industry because someone is climbing in a way that makes others uncomfortable and is obvious. I will tell you this, to God's because I mentioned it yesterday. Mm -hmm. Nick Wright is going to get a, and should get an enormous amount of money from Fox. One of the great joys for me of watching his ascent from Kansas City Radio Stugatz. He's at the parade hugging everyone before it becomes tragic. From Kansas City Radio, no one gets to make this rise. And the zig that he has done while everyone else is zagging is simply to believe in LeBron James and Patrick Mahomes during this time. <laughs> because everyone else is figuring out the ways to try to tear them down and tell you, hey, he's not Jordan. He's not Tom Brady. And therefore, he's not as great as you think he is. Caitlin Clark is not who? Like, who are we putting her up against? Because you can say compiler five years if you insist on hating. She hasn't played five years, though. That's no. literally a lie. No, but she got the extra year. So there is something no, going on in college sports where 23- and 24-year-olds are playing against 18-year-olds. Yeah, she's like, in her fourth year. Right. She has the right. opportunity to stay for a fifth year after the season. God, would I love for her to do that. Sure. But I don't believe she's going to. Just listening to her press conferences, how she sounds after games. Like, she's been very open about I'm treating the season as it's my last so she's not taking that extra time it's just wild like I have had the most fun in my entire life the the past few years being an Iowa women's basketball fan just like taking in all these moments and enjoying it and it's something I wish more people would do like we get to watch greatness all the time we get to watch Patrick Mahomes we get to watch Caitlin Clark like why don't we just sit have a good time just enjoy the things that are ahead of us because we may never see it again but Boom! Then, but then, Lucy, you see Iowa fans like making T-shirts that say "Don't be a Cheryl," disrespecting one of the legends of women's basketball, and you see how, like, maybe she was wrong. Cheryl Swoops was wrong in the number of games that Caitlin's played, but it does become a situation where now you're minimizing the achievements of a woman who was a pioneer in women's basketball. And I think you can't take Caitlin Clark out of a wider conversation about how women's basketball in general is covered, especially from the angle of race and the angle of sexuality and all of the things that we've talked about on the show like a hundred times, but I think that that is also part of the story here. Can we discuss this part, though, Stugatz? When you have a pioneer, okay, worth celebrating, where it's not just that she's great, it's that everywhere she pops up now is an event. The idea that we're talking about $10,000 courtside seats for something in women's basketball is a seminal, symbolic achievement. It's great. And uh, you can tear it down. And furthermore, in the content industry, Stugatz, you're rewarded for finding all of the ways that that's less great than you think it is because talking again and again about how great it is isn't good for the content machine. Just celebrating and being like, wow, Caitlin Clark, amazing. Or, hey, Mahomes, you're amazing. Or LeBron, you're amazing. The, the vibes that Lucy wants around sports are what the vibes should be but cannot be in, in the way that we cover sports or in the way that America is right now, we will pollute the escape hatch with all of our criticisms and we will soak it in our own unhappinesses. Allow me to help the conversation because I cover all sports the same, like championships and rings. Caitlin Clark has to win a championship. She, she cannot She's won go down. She's Big Ten championships. Uh, no, she, no, she has to win a let national my boy cook. championship. Let my boy cook. She, Lucy? You cannot go down as the greatest college basketball player of all time without winning a national championship. You can't do it. You cannot do it. And Caitlin Clark, who is generally considered the greatest player to ever play women's basketball, she's not. You cannot do that without winning at least one title. This is her last opportunity. She's going to go to the WNBA. She should go to the WNBA. But if she doesn't win a title, I'm not certain she'll be in my top five college basketball players of all time. How about that? What? Okay, so here's Help in the conversation. I, right. I mean, this is the way it should be covered. Yep. I Not think, Lottie Dottie, let's all celebrate yeah. Caitlin Clark. This let's is real this. equality. I mean, come Re on. Caitlin Clark needs You're to win a championship. Oh, I it love you, but go win something. I love you less. Um, <laughs> so here's... Here's my take on this. Well, I'm obviously super biased. I'm not going to say that Kaylin Clark is the best basketball player of all time. She's the best basketball player I have been able to watch in the college game. That's something that, like, it always makes me think about college football, college basketball, in a sense, where there's such a larger field and it's so much more competitive. Iowa doesn't have any other major recruits. We are not UConn. That It's not South Carolina. What she's done is arguably more impressive to me because – 
if Caitlin Clark was not on that team, Iowa would be, you know, in the tournament, probably losing the first round, second round. So it's, I think I get the title argument, but it just makes me want to throw up a little bit. Lucy, uh, you will in future generations be able to explain to the disrespectful kids <laughs> what Caitlin Clark actually meant. <laughs> To basketball and to sports. I would like to explain to She'd you. She'd mean more if she win a title. Anyway, this so. year, Stu, this year. <laughs> See you in Cleveland. Back to you, Dave. Do you, you. do you think they have a shot at winning the championship this year, Lucy? I actually really do. I, I want to know what's I was due. a little nervous. South Carolina's amazing, yeah. and South Carolina definitely, they are, they're upset about what happened in the tournament last year. When I watched Iowa's game against Penn State, not a particularly amazing team, Caitlin, not her best game. Hannah Stalky, though, wow, was she playing great. Kate Martin, wow, did she look good. If the if the like the surrounding cast for Caitlin can step up a little, yeah. it's very tough to beat this Iowa team. I'll tell you that. Let me clear the air on something. You will never see me in Cleveland. Back to you, Dave. That's fair. <laughs> Quiet as it's kept, we'll never see you in Sioux City either. And we were Sioux very Falls. Sioux Falls, excuse me. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll pay the fine. We'll never see you in Sioux Falls either because evidently everybody, what happened there? How did it all fall apart? He was going from one day to the next. Well, it, it all fell apart because Stugatz never wanted to do it in the first. No, place. but he was ready to do it, and now it's really well, falling it was, apart. It was, it was, it's it was, never going to happen well, now, it but it was going those, to happen. I mean, no, it wasn't because he was never, he got everything that he asked for, and he still and didn't more. go. Yeah. yeah. And he still didn't go. Yeah. But it ended up being a win because if uh, you follow the local papers, the person organizing it got into a bit of trouble. Yes. Carton-like. Yes. Mm-hmm. And now it's gone forever. It's uh, My laziness paid off. I mean, well, it's in this respect, yes. It's that, that would fall apart with a scam that doesn't involve you is a real upset. Oh, he would have been tangled up in Embroiled. it. Embroiled. Yeah. Stu always had his radar up about that guy. Yeah. Stu's like something about that guy. Takes one to no one. I did. Yeah. <laughs> The place I was going to take this, though, Lucy, because you will one day be able to explain what Caitlin Clark meant to people. I want to show you a quick video right now of Bo Jackson. I don't know what Bo Jackson means to you. Joe, uh, Bo Jackson is at an Auburn game, and he is waving a pom-pom. And Carrot Top comes over and wants to take a selfie. And Bo Jackson uh, tells him, hey, how about you uh, live life instead of take a picture of living life and runs Carrot Top out of the proceedings. Uh, Lucy, what do you know about Bo Jackson, about his legend, about who he is? Because I would speak about Bo Jackson the way that you speak about Caitlin Clark. Well, I know he played two sports. I've watched You Don't Know Bo, the 30 for 30, but it was probably like, I don't know, 10 years ago when I watched that. So, like, he's not an athlete. Like, I know who Bo Jackson is. Also, was he the guy that couldn't get rid of his hiccups? I believe that was Bo Jackson. I think that is true. Yeah, That's so a good I know thing. him for that as well. That's good a good recall. Thing. That's a good thing to remember about <laughs> Joe Bo Jackson in, in word association. Uh, Stugatz, what are your thoughts there? Play that video again. Uh, Bo Jackson insisting that the young people live life instead of take a picture of living life. He's coming over and he it's wants It's an to, aggressive head shake by him. Because he's like, live your life. I'm waving a pom-pom I, I, here. Live your life is awfully convenient for someone that doesn't want to take a selfie, though. No, but I totally agree. You lose moments because you're stuck in your phone and you're trying to take pictures just enjoy the moment and have your own memories i mean you can see his mouth he's like no i'm in the moment right no. yes enjoy it this is clearly happening during the game so yeah yeah say no you're there to enjoy it like if it had <laughs> happened at halftime then i'd be like hey that you probably should have just taken the picture and be nice but like i get it how Wait. about bo getting in there with a nice he's just he's he's cheering right now he's like i'm cheering right now look at this thing yeah pom-pom also sets a perimeter <laughs> You're this right. is a definitely Stay a, away. definitely yeah. a I see both sides thing. If you see Bo Jackson, one of the greatest running backs of all time in college football, like you, you want to take a selfie. Yeah, if especially you're Bo Jackson, if you're, especially if you're at Auburn. Right, and if you're Bo Jackson, get the hell away from me. There's gameplay happening right now. I'm going to be able to explain to people for eternity that there was an athlete who played football and professional baseball. There were two of them during that time. I got so spoiled as a kid, so spoiled as a kid growing up that I just thought it was normal that multiple athletes <laughs> yes, would be same. playing multiple sports uh, at the exact same time. Hey, all it still happens. Bo Jackson. Jeff Samarjo was my example growing up. Yes. Oh, it, the shark. Yes. Jordan Faison for Notre Dame. But, but Scored a goal in the lacrosse game yesterday. You say Samarja. We had better right? examples. Yes, we had better examples. Samarja Julius Peppers. pitched Tyler Buckner some also. for Notre Dame and did some spot starting for the Cubs. Jimmy Graham. Didn't, Hopefully Norchad O'Meara. I do Samarja Giants, not Samarja Cubs. Did some Cubs. 
did Samarja play a professional football? Did no. he play? He no, but he could baseball. have. He could have. Yeah, he definitely could have. He was no, a great no, wide again, receiver. No, no, again, Bo and Dion did. <laughs> what do you mean yeah, he could have? No, they did. They, they did. I'm just saying at a high level. there's modern <laughs> examples, Dan, specifically Notre Dame ones that I grew right, up with. Yes. But they did. Right. It, they, they, Samarja didn't. When you start with Bo and Dion, you have to outdo Dan there. You didn't. Yeah. Who's the last person that tried? <laughs> was it Tony Gonzalez? Kyler Murray. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. That no, no. Russell Wilson? No. Oh. No, they did. <laughs> that was something. You're making they, a, a distinction Tebow. here that I don't think matters. Russell Tebow. Wilson. Russell Wilson played in a spring training game. If you're interested in movies, if you're interested in sports business, if you're interested in sports and baseball, these two guys have you covered. Uh, Cinephile is Adnan Verk's movie podcast. Nothing personal is David Sampson's all-encompassing uh, podcast. I recommend both. I recommend everyone listening here to check those out because they're doing it differently than most people are doing it. Uh, before we get started here on what their top five lists are, though, Samson, I need to call you out on a, a hypocrisy and inconsistency that a lot of people have been calling you out on since yesterday because you came on here yesterday regarding Travis Kelsey, and this is what you had to say. The consequences had to be because Travis Kelsey ends up in a situation where he bumps his coach. Uh, listen to David Sampson on that subject matter. And I would have benched him. I would have had oh, come gone on. for one second. <laughs> David, get come out of here. Right come David, on. Are you serious? Come David. on. If a baseball player attacks a manager physically during a game, you don't think he's taken out of the game? I, do okay. I should have benched him for the game. What he did is inexcusable, and no one talks about it because no one wants to upset Taylor. It's a joke. You think that's the reason no one's talking about it, that we're afraid of t upsetting Taylor Swift? I'm a, I'm a, you're not talking about it because you don't want to be on the unpopular side of any issues like this. No, what do you, you don't realize yeah, that there's Dan, a team. You're afraid what of the big issues. What if someone in your container attacked you, Dan? <laughs> what if someone attacked you right now? You're not going to put them in the quote unquote real penalty box? Give me a break. Stugatz, and he, I would have. He also called it unacceptable and he also said no excuse. And this is why, David. You get accused of being a management shill because here is some sound dug up by others and our video team of you talking about when Bruce Arian slapped one of his players in the back of the head during a game. Don't put your hands on the players. I, I couldn't disagree with you more. We cannot legislate against coaching that involves that, some sort uh, of... David, that was not coaching. That was not coaching, David. Don't tell me that what Bruce Arians In did... Bruce Arians' mind, and he thinks it's coaching. No, I'm with you. I agree with you. But coaching, Arians man. thinks he's Get coaching. out of here. He Just, thinks it is, Okay, though. but I don't care what he thinks. Right. That's, That's not... the only thing that you should care about. <laughs> Intent. Don't touch the players. Like, you can I coach like them. The... Don't do it angrily. How about that? I'm sorry, don't do man. it angrily. You're right. We're dealing into something that may have something to do with somebody's past, and we're digging deep into psychological territory here. But your reaction to this is so emotional and personal that there's got to be Because you're here. an executive in charge, and it bothers me that you guys think it's okay to manhandle the employees. It bothers me. Oh, that's what we. That's what Bruce did. You're right. I'm, I'm wrong. He manhandled them. You're right. <laughs> David. That's what that was. He hit him. I may have seen the wrong video. David, I'm, I must have seen the wrong video. He hit him in the back of the head, David. Hit him. You stop using, especially on a show that's audio, you're using verbs that people will associate with something that is not actually real. He didn't manhandle. He didn't hit. He didn't abuse. There is serious things that go on with players and with kids. Let's not for a minute say that what Bruce Arians did goes to that level. So, David, should Kelsey just have slapped Andy Reid in the back of the head? <laughs> wow. Arians, the slap on the helmet in the middle of a football game, if you can't distinguish that from what Kelsey physically did to Reid, I'd, why didn't you put the video up of both of these circumstances rights, other rights than issues. just the audience? Rights issues. we got to pay for them. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Fair point. <laughs> Football is aggressive about that. Basketball That's the is end less. Of that. But wait you a minute. No, me. but this is your prism, David, and it's consistent. The angry old man can do what he wants. The angry young man cannot because one's an employee and the other one's in charge. Yeah, this is not a management player issue for me. This is looking at what you're doing for your entire team. 
when a player does that is so out of line, the coach and the front office has to do something, even if it's the star first ballot Hall of Famer. Totally distinguishable from what happened with Arians and that slap on the helmet. David, what Arians did, it had more physical contact in it than what Travis did. If you think that that player was in as great physical harm and and scared then he wailed on him on the back of the head he hit him in the back of the head go show oh you don't have the video david we just looked at it jessica you're looking at the video right now what did arians do to the back of that player's head he lunges (laughs) forward and smacks the guy in the back of the helmet i like it to see it done to stugatz we're gonna do a recreation here Uh, uh, camera people just come on stugatz's face whoops bad phrasing oh (laughs) jeez what happened there here we go. We are right, going to recreate this. We're going to recreate this. You're softer, this. please. I mean. <laughs> Not softer. <laughs> just stare straight ahead. I think she's embarrassed because of what you just said. <laughs> I think she is. She is now physically Something about dead. My face. You ruined it, Dan. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's what I do. All right. Here we go. Right. Are you ready? Gentle. And she, she let up there. <laughs> yeah. She didn't go full force. Cody's right. She didn't right. do it. It's she. Arians whacked somebody in the back of the head, and you're okay with it, David, because it's management. Wait, can we show it on the i? Can we show it on Mike's no, iPad not or really. not? Really? No, we've got a rights issue. Here. What if we that can... player did the same exact thing to Arians? I believe that that player would have been benched if not released, but for being a first ballot Hall of Famer. Adnan, do you have any thoughts here before we get into the top five? No, I'm just. Uh... I'm, I'm outraged. That's all I am. Just the fact that the NFL is, is not allowing us to show these rights. That's really my main concern. But I, I can't wait to get to the movies. I'm sure David's list stinks. Just like his opinion on <laughs> Travis Kelsey being benched. Boy, that was so additive, Adnan. Thank you for joining the conversation. <laughs> Number five. What is the opinion. list that we're doing? What is the list that we're doing? I thought we were doing this on Valentine's Day on a day when we could have some sort of love in the air. So Adnan and I wanted to do the top five most romantic movies ever. Wow. Hmm. All right. That's going to be do, all right. That's going to be an impressive list. Wow. Let's see if we number have five, <laughs> Cyrano. <laughs> Cyrano is a movie starring Pete Dinklage from a couple of years ago. Obviously the story of Cyrano de Bergerac. And it was a movie that if it didn't, put a huge hole in your heart of love, then uh, you have no heart. I preferred Roxanne, because that's where Steve Martin had oversized snout, rather than it being a little person as the malady. But I do like Dinklage. He's fine. It's all right. Did you ever see the original with Gerard Depardieu? Yeah, that yes. one's better. Yeah. Except he's canceled, so I can't put that on the list. They what canceled Gerard Depardieu? What do you mean? Oh, yeah. Yes. He got accused the of French a lot love of him. bad things. He's canceled except for in France. So are you? Oh, I think true, he's Adam. canceled especially in France. Are you saying that that movie was better but is not on your list because he was canceled? No, I like Cyrano better, but I wouldn't put a Gerard Depardieu. That would be like me telling you I would put Lethal Weapon on a list. On principle alone, I won't put it on any list now because of Mel Gibson. I didn't realize that your lists were contaminated by cancellations. (laughs) I didn't realize that. My list is contaminated by personal cancellations. Okay, so you're in your personal record book. This is your top five people who have been canceled. Stugatsbook.com. Okay, number four. (laughs) That's exactly right. Number four. Number four is one of my all-time favorite movies directed by Richard Linklater called Before Sunrise with Julie Delpy and Ethan Hawke. This is about people who meet on a train and spend an entire night together. And I have tried to recreate that night in various places around the world. And I've been successful (laughs) several times. And it is... uh, it, it just go see it. It's a trilogy, but start with Before Sunrise. David Sampson, you'll never be Ethan Hawke. Okay, so go ahead and replicate whatever you want. I, I prefer Before Sunset, and the trilogy is amazing. Linklater is a great director. I, I really can't quibble with this choice. It's a good one. Wow. You're quibbling with the fact that I've ever had that experience, Adnan? I promise you yeah, that's you it, I have. Yeah, that's right. I, I, I just I don't think you can it. replicate that. I don't, I don't think you have the magnetism of Ethan Hawke to replicate that. Don't even bother. Yeah, well, maybe you should get to know me better. Number three. <laughs> what does that Broke mean? Back Mountain. <laughs> wait a minute. Wait, wait a minute. Are you suggesting that you could have a romantic night like that that would disprove Adnan Verk if he simply saw your romantic moves? 1,000%. Oh, God. <laughs> right. He got game. Okay. If you speak to people 
play. We don't have to do this. Let's not do this. Number three. If I speak to people, let's interview all the people that Dave has made swoon with his one Yes, all the paramours of Samson's life. I look forward to discussing that with them. (laughs) I need to speak to my lawyer first, but once I do, I am more than happy to give you a top five list of that. Do you ever speak to anyone without speaking to your attorney first? (laughs) No, my mom didn't raise no fool. (laughs) Number three, Brokeback Mountain. Brokeback Mountain, if you you can't get through the fact that it is one of the most romantic movies, the relationship between Heath Ledger and Jake Gyllenhaal, it came at a time directed by Ang Lee where it was not as acceptable as it is now, and it should have been, and it should be, and it always should be, but their relationship is one of the best on-screen relationships in history. Number Battle Ranchers, gay. (laughs) Number two. Adulterers. (laughs) Only one of them was. Oh, no, they both were. Anne Hathaway was one And of the were you, if and we Michelle were consulting Williams. with your attorney. Number two. I didn't say that, You Dan. did not say that. I know you didn't because you didn't consult with your attorney. I have no idea what you're attorney. even talking about. Number two. Hold on. We have to cut that out. I I've, I've, don't know what you mean, Dan. Number two, Moulin Rouge. The greatest thing about life is love. It always has been for me. You and McGregor, Nicole Kidman, Toulouse Lautrec, and uh, nothing more to say about that. And the number one most romantic movie, and there will never be a different number one, is The Notebook. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Terrible. I've rewatched it time and time again. It is waterworks every time. I want to be the relationship that Ryan Gosling and Rachel McAdams had. And I wanted to die like James Garner and Gina Rowlands oh. holding hands in a nursing home. And I absolutely failed miserably at that goal. But that was something that I aspire to. And that is the type of love that everyone should want. The only thing we have in common, I said, did want to die while watching that movie. 54% Rotten Tomatoes. Absolutely terrible. I mean, that is the height of maudlin and overly sentimental. I mean, Waterworks, I suppose, since you're soft, Samson. But honestly, I'd rather watch Stugatz's only OnlyFans page than watch The Notebook. Thank you. I have no response to that. <laughs> Just make sure you pay him his money. <laughs> Adnan, your top five looks how different? Uh, uh, mine's is good, Dan. Number five is four weddings and a funeral. <laughs> Hugh Grant is most charming and foppish and romantic. F word for the first 10 words of the movie. Really funny, really charming. Number four, nobody puts baby in a corner. Dirty dancing. <laughs> Again, iconic, swooning, Romance. I, there's no way Samson doesn't love Dirty Dancing. That's why I know he's staying quiet. Number three, another one of his favorites, and everyone's favorite, quite frankly, Billy Crystal, Meg Ryan. I'll have what she's having when Harry met Sally. That's his deli. <laughs> number two, Casablanca. We'll always have Paris. Oh, stop it. And, and, no, no, and number one, listen, I'm serious about this one. This is the number one. Seriously, all kidding aside. You can't get a movie better than a guy who's in love with a hooker. Pretty woman. Oh, oh man. No Rocky, huh? I believe we have lost again, Lucy and Jessica, because you guys insist on choosing movies from 50 and 60 and 70 years ago. My movies are current. There, are you telling me that Lucy and Jessica haven't seen all five of my movies? No, I don't. I, don't. I haven't seen. I think I've seen one of them. Which one? I th- I've Moulin seen Rouge. The Notebook. Oh, oh. I, geez, I can't get past Adnan seen. having a movie podcast and not knowing like what Gerard Depardieu's been up to the last ten years because like it's listen, pretty it's bad. not that I don't know what's Jess, Jess, Jess. It's not that I know what's up to. I separate the art from the artist. Okay, oh, yeah, I'm not going to yeah, condemn yeah. him like Samson. I'm not like Samson on a pulpit here uh, excoriating everybody for their sins. That's mm. perfectly fine if he's willing to do uh, so. I was, just, I was just informed. There's a lot of sins. I'm Ooh. bad, bad dude. How about True Lies? <laughs> true Lies, Jamie Lee Curtis. Thank uh, you. <laughs> All I'm saying is that I need the movies to be somewhat fresher because you guys are talking and I'm listening and I like your movies. I like your choices. I like the historical context. I like how thorough you are. And I'm looking at the 20 somethings in our room and they don't have any idea what you're talking about. Cyrano is from two years ago. Listen, by that logic, Samson wins because Cyrano was two years ago. Yeah, I've seen it. I've seen When Harry Met Sally. Nice. Way to go, Lucy. Hmm. David, you see Lucy. How great is when Harry met Sally? I like it a lot. I think it's a cute movie. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm looking for. One of the romantic moments I had is when I took someone to Katz's Deli to try to sit at the uh, table yeah. where it happened, 
and it just happens to be that it's right. I have a, there's a picture of me on the wall of Katz's Deli, and I was not aware of it, and it was right there, and we were Damn sitting there. Me. That is the number one look at me, Louie, I could give you. <laughs> and I got to tell you, it had the opposite effect that I thought it would have. Could have told you that. If you're ever, ever at the Weston Bonaventure in Washington, D.C., head to the elevators, and you'll see a plaque that uh, that honors the scene in True Lies where Arnold rode that elevator with a horse. Thank you. So, David, you were going for a Cyrano moment at Katz's Deli. You pointed to your picture on the wall. No. The waiter pointed it out to who I was with. And? And I demurred. I just said, oh, I didn't know it was there because I'd heard about it, but I'd never seen it. But the whole thing was looked at as a setup. And it was not. It was all over pastrami. <laughs> uh, put it on the poll, please, Juju. At Lebitard showed, are you surprised at all that David Sampson's love interest would distrust him and think him in scam over pastrami? <laughs> at Lebitard show. Uh, thank you, guys. Thank you. Point break. Point break. <laughs> Made him a terrible cop. Have a good day, everybody. Now, we stumble into a lot of things in this show, <laughs> but I don't think we've ever done better than Dan in the last segment. Camera people, just come on Stugatz's face. Whoops, bad what? phrasing. <laughs> oh, jeez. I mean, Dan, bravo to you. I mean, we usually, like, there's like, uh, oh, what did he mean by that? Ooh, that was kind of, that was just. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Usually we're like, ha-ha, phrasing. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, it lacked some subtlety. And if you weren't watching on video, Jessica was coming in here. I denied us the moment of him, uh, of Stugatz being slapped hard Hang on, on the back second. of the phrasing head. Phrasing again? Yep. Walking in here. Uh, Camera just people, just come on Stugatz's <laughs> face. Whoops. You should have used ejaculate. <laughs> All right, Jason, let's go. No? So Jessica comes in here to slap Stugatz on the side of the head and instead ends up corpse-like on the floor in the dead <laughs> position. I don't think video caught that because they were too busy coming on Stugatz's face. Was my Bruce Arians all right, though? Like, I tried to not actually hit him very hard. You but were fine. You yeah. had to hit him hard. I think he was ready to let you have it. Yeah. I don't want to really smack around. him that hard. I was bracing myself for something bigger, but it was fun. I uh, sabotaged everything by yes. killing her before it started. I appreciate it. Jess. The Bruce Arians thing was clearly worse than what Travis Kelsey did. Because the Kelsey thing is just like a bump in the heat of a moment. Like, Arians goes out of his way, lunges. Winds up. And it's just, it's way worse. You know, I think it would go a long way for David in terms of the general likability things that we run into with him to just say, <laughs> you got me. Yeah, yeah, no, that is good work by you and your team. He's not going to do that it. That is a hypocrisy. No. You caught me. Not happening. I just don't think he's capable of looking at it through anything other than his prism on he was management in sports and management has to be in control. It's a plague in sports and it actually separates management from the generation that is playing sports. The fact that so many of them look at it the way that David does. We have to be in charge and we have to show people at all times we're in charge. Well, it's presently why the, the greatest coach of all time is without a job. How about that one? I think we sort of skipped past the fact that the Atlanta Falcons in the last 12 months have said no to the MVP of the league and the best coach ever. Don't need him. I don't even know necessarily if we can make it like entirely an age or generation thing because of what we talked about a little bit last week on the show with Kyle Shanahan um, videoing his staff when he's not in meetings with them and essentially like spying on them while they're in position group meetings and his explanation we talked about it on godless football stew with you yeah. and kaylin kaylor from the athletic and billy and his explanation is like he wants to make sure like they're getting everything right and the messaging is all cohesive and everything like that but like from my point of view like i wouldn't want video cameras in every room that i'm in if i'm working for someone i'd like to have at least a little bit of Wait, are these cameras on? <laughs> While video was just coming on Stugatz's face. You told me these were a prop. Uh, this is interesting to me, Stugatz. Mm. It really is in terms of philosophically where it is we're headed with leadership, especially in our most militaristic sports. Mm -hmm. Bill Belichick is out of work. Jay Glazer has been telling you for months now. 
The philosophies in football have changed. The coaches realize that they have to keep evolving to reach their young players who are built differently. Tom Brady just said, you guys saw the quotes for the first time. Not even the 10-part documentary on Apple did this. Tom Brady is saying, I wouldn't have played for that style anymore. I learned my power. Not one more year. Uh, Not one more year would I have played for Belichick the way that he was doing things. And the way the sport has evolved, Stugatz, Bruce Arians won a championship with Brady being close to 70 years old, slapping players on the head. Right. And you cannot have the power that Travis Kelsey presently has and keep him confined to the cage of he's always got to listen to coach with no missteps. There always has to be authority. The relationship has to be broader than that. It cannot be parent ordering child around anymore. The players have too much power for that. So they're going to bump up against it in heated moments, and it's going to result in, a lot of times, either management like Kraft supports the Belichick Patriot way or football grows out of it because today's players, Stugatz, realizes Patrick Mahomes knows, do you realize that when I go to the camera and say it's not okay anymore for the black player to be held down, Roger Goodell's going to immediately apologize for all things Kaepernick related because that's what happens when the employees have power. Brady said that, though, Dan, about Belichick after winning six Super Bowls with Belichick. A lot easier to say. If you're an organization that hasn't won in a long time and you feel like you're on the verge of winning and you don't want Bill Belichick because he's going to work you too hard, please. I don't want to hear from you. I really don't. Okay, but uh, he's being paid $375 million by Fox, more than Mahomes will make for playing the games because people do want to hear from him, and that's what he's going to say Mm-hmm. now right. that he's free from the military prison system that he's played in that produced some winning, but then he left, right. and it wasn't like that, and he won also not playing that way. It's not the only way to win, Stugan. But I understand. No, it's not. For sure, it's not. But I understand saying that after absorbing Bill Belichick for as long as Tom Brady did. If you're Justin Herbert, you don't want Bill Belichick? I don't want Justin Herbert. How about that? My point is that Brady went elsewhere and won. And the next generation that arrives behind Brady. For players coach Bruce Arians. Players coach Bruce Arians who slaps players in the head, (laughs) but was viewed as more of a players coach than Belichick was. Yeah, but he's also like a disciplinarian. I mean, I, I went through years sharing my opinions on Bruce Arians. There was a reason why it took so long for him to get a job. But that part has aged out. The sport has aged out, and now what you get is the youngsters who are spying on their coaches in the video room because they learned from the culture. I mean, Shanahan comes. How about you learn the rules? Stugatz. It never gets old. It's never going to get old. It's never going to get old. Might not even be true, but. Wear that one. He's going to have to wear it. I mean, what's true is the players didn't know. (laughs) Kyle Shanahan descends from someone like Belichick and Arians. And learned how to do it a different way. And so he will connect with his players differently while surveilling his coaches (laughs) in their meeting rooms. Because it's not like you're going to lose all of this paranoia and all of this crazy. They're just going to adapt to handle it better as the employees become more unruly because they have actual power in a sport that doesn't allow them to have power because they're disposable and it's salary capped and it makes it very hard for a player, especially Stugatz, a tight end like Kelsey, to have the power to bump a coach and survive it, to bump a coach and go on the number one podcast in America and say, ha, 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 me and my drunk brother, (laughs) I bumped the coach, ha, ha, ha. He's also never really been like that. Travis Kelsey has been intense, but not in that fashion. And I I wonder what's happening there. And what I landed on was it was just a much tougher year, everything. That that for Travis, yeah. Well, for everybody on that Kansas City offense, <laughs> like it's the first real frustration, legitimate frustration that played out on the field. Because look, man, they got lit up by Aiden O'Connell didn't have a passing yard in the second half. Do you guys at all find this this generational? Because Jessica's saying it's not generational, but it feels to me 
like Belichick 70, and he's dealing with the, the players who won the Super Bowl for the Chiefs are in their 20s. I mean, Kelsey, too, but the defensive players who won the Super Bowl right. for the Chiefs. I think that's unfair, though, because the, the oldest coach in the league was Pete Carroll, and he didn't have the same reputation. There's a lot going on with Belichick, military background, whatnot. Sure. But Carroll came from Parcells. But, Car- but Carroll was always viewed as super different from the st- from the Parcells. Is that, players coach. Yeah, it's the that, gum. But, but right. it's the generational point that you're it's making. Five? It's approach. I mean, Andy Reid is 65 years old. He has a different style than Bill Belichick, for certain. And he you, allows players to do that to yeah, him. Yeah, Vermeil good with was yeah. an older guy, but right. was always viewed as a player's coach guy. I love that Andy Reid was looking out for Travis Kelsey. It speaks to their relationship, saying, hey, there's a lot of cameras on me all the time. It's the Super Bowl. What are you doing? Stop doing it. I, I just find most interesting in the employee-employer relationship that the employer is being forced to to be more human about the frailties of the employee. Like, it's best to cover it the way Andy Reid does, to do it with love, but you better have a real relationship. It's not going to make you survive the Seattle organization if you're Pete Carroll. He had real relationships with them, and he's now run out of that building. He had real For relationships. year old coach. Right, but Andy Reid is winning. <laughs> I mean, well, but every Bel- year. But my set, my, what I'm telling you is, yes, Andy Reid is winning. So was Belichick. <laughs> and now he can't get a job. <laughs> like, because you better be able to deal with Kelsey's power. But he went three years without winning. Yeah, the winning stopped. Yeah. That's, what, that's what it needs. Yes, the winning has to be there. This is Comedy Central right here. He is joining us from the road. Look at him from his hotel room. <laughs> joining us from oh, yeah. on, on tour, I think, in Oklahoma City. He's got shows coming up in Irvine, California, yeah. Salt Lake City, Boston. What a great shirt. Captain Clutch. Yes. I mean. uh, he wants to. Well, he wants to talk about the Knicks. He's auditioning to become our Knicks correspondent, Stugatz, because all the comedians, they, this is the best Knicks season we've seen in 25 years. Yeah. Jesus wants to be our Knicks correspondent. Mero wants to be our Knicks correspondent. Huh. He's got a Netflix uh, Netflix special coming. Or it's out now. Same time tomorrow. And uh, Sam Morell is with us now to talk Knicks basketball and other things. Our timing is bad, though, Sam, because this is the worst stretch the Knicks have gone through this season. They've lost four in a row. Everyone's hurt. We're depleted by injuries, and, uh, you know, it, it's a tough time because we just got to get healthy. We're so deep all of a sudden. The quickly trade made us a little thin. You know, but we got OG, and then, then he gets hurt. Uh, Burks and, and Bohan, I think that's going to help a lot once we're uh, once we're all healthy. But we don't have a big man. We don't have uh, Hardenstein, Mitchell. You know, Sims is in and out. He, like him getting COVID. I'm like, are you are you kidding me? COVID. You know, so uh, it, it's been tough. But uh, and then the and the refs, Ed Malloy's team stole a game from us the other night, and uh, just despicable. Should never be allowed to ref a Knicks game again. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm with I, I, you. Don't, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to say the words Guantanamo Bay, but they come to mind. Whoa, you know? uh, torture, torture is what yeah. you're. Co- I, I want to play for you our famous Ed Malloy sound. This is him. This, this is how you felt the other night against Houston. Here's Ed Malloy ruining a Timberwolves game. Down by two, 198 inbound to Love on the left side with one dribble goes up for the shot. It's blocked by Marion. The ball comes into the arms of Dalabear. The horn sounds and the ball game is over the Timberwolves are screaming for a foul there was none called Rubio off to love oh that's a foul that is unbelievable the referees are booed as they go off the floor brutal David Guthrie is right there he didn't have the guts to call it also go oh, Ed Malloy <laughs> <laughs> That's how you felt the other night against the Rockets. We hate him. It? He cost us. He cost us. I believe it was his team that cost us the home opener against the Celtics. So, Go Ed Malloy! Uh, <laughs> criminal. He's a criminal. Uh, we, we despise him. <laughs> we'll remind him of this whenever we see him. Uh, his team. The fact that they can't just. I want a five-minute overtime. You come come to the Garden. We'll come to Houston. We want five minutes. But the fact that we had all the momentum and they just stole that from us. Just despicable. Go Adam Malloy! Silver, do the right thing. And boy, did that take me back. Sam Dallenberg, also an ex-Nick right there. But uh, yeah, man, just uh, not right, especially when, like, okay, if we're going to lose this game, then let us rest Brunson and DiVincenzo, who have been playing 
92 minutes a night. You know, Tibbs is killing our guys because we're thin right now. So uh, <laughs> it's not it's not right. Not that's, right. That's what Thibodeau that's does. That's all. Though. That's all Tibbs does. What are you talking about? Kills Thibodeau, his team. He's going to run you all into the ground. You too are going to feel like you've played 82 <laughs> regular season games before Thibodeau is done with you. It's true. It's true. I tore my Achilles watching, but uh, you know, uh, no. I mean, look. I don't think it's going to be quite as bad once we have like a legit eight, nine guy rotation for the playoffs. Cause we are all of a sudden kind of deep. The Bogdanovich off the bench move is, is like, man, what I think mean, I hate to lose Grimes, but I think it's a nice, it's a nice move. Precious is looking great by the way. Uh, OG when he's healthy is a game changer. I'm like, I, I will put us against the Celtics dude. Uh-oh. I will do it. Mike Ryan. Are you hearing I, him? He's filled with Nick's hope. He's be- he's putting them against the Celtics. He only, thinks that- only I'm not if- saying, I'm not saying we're going to win, right. but I say we can give him a good fight. Well, that's nice of you. <laughs> You'll put him against them. No, I had PTSD when he said precious because right. it's precious, uh, precious Achua, who was a part of the Goran Dragic trade to Toronto. That got us Cal Lowry, who I hate with a passion. Yeah, but he's playing great. I think what you're saying is you'll take on the Celtics with OG though, right? Oh, we need OG because yes. I think OG can make Tatum's life pretty bad. And, uh, you know, uh, we're deep. I mean, we don't do, we don't have like six of our eight rotation players. What do you expect? We don't have Randall. We don't have Mitchell. We don't have Hardenstein. We don't have OG who is like turned into a legit, like he's, he's a legit DPOI uh, candidate the way he's playing. If he's healthy. You love Hartenstein, and I think the uh, and I think basketball people do I too. Do. But a lot of people would laugh at the idea that he's the difference maker against the Celtics. Little things, Dan. He is. Yeah, he is because matchups are everything. And I, as much as I love Mitchell Robinson, I think the KP matchup is a little difficult. So, uh, you know, much love to KP, another former Nick, who uh, I think uh, we wish things ended differently. Obviously, but. I think Hardenstein defensively, like, if you watch basketball, like, that's why I know Stephen A. Smith doesn't watch basketball. When he goes, some guy named Hardenstein, shut up, Stephen A. Watch an actual game before you discredit the blue-collar work ethic of the great Isaiah Hardenstein, who has been the glue this year, and I only hope we can find the money to resign him. You really don't like uh, Stephen A. Smith's Knicks analysis, do you? He's a curse to the franchise. Stop rooting for us. I don't want you on our side. You have anytime he calls a game, we lose. Go away. I like that you called out Stephen A. When Dan was like, "Ah, I've Hartenstein, some guy named Hartenstein." <laughs> that pissed me off. That really pissed me <laughs> off. Take out Levitor, man. No, but I'm I I prefaced it by saying I know how much he loves Hartenstein, and I know that America America is laughing at the idea that that would be the difference against the Celtics. I'm not even sure that you would dispute that that would be America's appraisal, not necessarily basketball people's appraisal. Well, maybe America's got to get on the Hardenstein page like I am because this guy's doing all the dirty work. I, I love this guy. Tibbs reinvented his game. He was like a stretch five on the Clippers. He comes here. He becomes like a badass. You know, uh, I'm just worried. He's sitting out now with an, like a sore Achilles. And I'm like, what the hell is that? I don't know what a sore Achilles is. But that, that scares the hell out of me. So rest till you're 100, you know. Let's uh, <laughs> let's play this sound to agitate Sam Morrell. I respectfully disagree. And we all know that how I feel about my Knicks, but they're 26th in defensive efficiency rating. Um, Mitchell Robinson is out. Uh, Jericho Sims is out. So I got to deal with some dude named Hartenstein. Who's been playing with him? An an effort. effort, He he never gives you, he never shortchanges you with effort. I'm not trying to be disrespectful. Yeah, uh, you are disrespectful. Some guy, (laughs) this dude's an NBA player. Uh, so I, I have to listen to some guy named Stephen A. Smith who doesn't know what the f- he's talking about. And holy, like, how could ESPN get any worse? Like, I'm just like, dude, replace him with like RJ or JJ or someone who knows what they're talking about. And thank God for Kendrick Perkins, who's become an, you know, a surprising ally to Nick's uh, Twitter and <laughs> Nick's fan base. I never thought I'd find the day where I love Kendrick Perkins, but this guy finally gives us props. No TNT. I love those guys, but they won't give the Knicks props. They won't give Jalen Brunson props. Like, you know, I don't know what Kenny Smith has against New York, being a New York guy, but, like, get over it, dude. We're here. We're No one wants us in the playoffs. We just got to get healthy. Bruno! Who are the sports analysts that make you angriest? Stephen A's up there. Uh, I, I like most. I mean, look, I, I don't watch enough. to Like, I watch Breen and Walt Frazier, so I, I have the two best in the game calling for my Knicks. 
Uh, you know, I love Kenny Albert. I love the Knicks rotation. I like Alan Hahn a lot. A- any of those guys are, are great. Uh, the ones who make me angry, Stephen A. Um, Doris Burke bugs me. I got to be honest. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. Like, stop riding Jason Tatum's jock this hard. It's unbelievable. It's like, uh, were you, are you from Southie? Do I, uh, did I miss something? Uh, she dry, I wish there was a way to mute her and I could just listen to Mike Breen. Honestly. So basically, so you see, she's all, so anti Knicks. No one has an issue with well, Doris Burke. No one, no one media, does. But right? your bias, you have so much Knicks bias, and you're so mad at the media in general for laughing at the Knicks for 25 yes. years that you're yeah. car- you're carrying all sorts of scars. Because correct me if I'm wrong, this is the Knicks team that you've believed in the most. Yeah, and exactly. And look, the the four seed Randall year was a pleasant surprise. I always believe so. That's that is a sickness, and you know, and it can be a curse, but it also keeps me positive about the Knicks. And and I love that team with uh, Randall. I mean, how far are you really going to go with with? It wasn't a great offensive team, but man, they played good D, and that kind of rebuilt their identity to to what it is today. And if we're healthy. Do you really want to play against Mitchell Robinson, Hardenstein, that combo? <laughs> yes. OG Ananobi? Yes, in like the worst possible way. Yes. Yeah, you think? Yes. Celtics fan? Yes. All the, oh, no, no, I'm not a Celtics fan. No, no, Heat no, fan. No, no. Heat fan. Sort of. Heat fan. Oh, Tapping oh, in Miami oh, Heat oh, fan your, here. Your team, hey, look, uh, all due respect to the Miami Heat, you guys are washed. Oh, Jimmy's yeah. incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Jimmy's yeah. an incredible player. Bam's an incredible player. Yeah. Duncan Robinson's actually my buddy, and I, I – I was at one of the games against the Heat. Yeah, you can high five him when he eliminates you in five. Yeah, but you'll shoot confetti off for that one win. All this to lose a high man. One win. We went. We we were two wins against you guys injured. We're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna cook you guys this year. <laughs> okay. We should have won. We should have won that series. You're right. You are cute. <laughs> oh, thank you. Oh, by the way, on the headboard, <laughs> you're cute. Are, are those straps? <laughs> are those straps? Yeah, no. look, look yeah, behind you on the headboard. Right. Oh, yeah. You got a little Zadino Chara situation going over there. Well, it's a nice hotel. What do you want from me, <laughs> uh, Sam? Any Super Bowl thoughts? Uh, if you want to keep talking about the Knicks, we certainly yeah. can because I, I sure. want, I want to have you on as a uh, correspondent because we're going to heat up all this heat Knicks stuff with the comedians because oh, there are it. a lot of there. New York gets loud when they're good, and they haven't had reason. They haven't had a lot of reasons over the last fifteen or twenty years. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm, look, we all saw that Knicks uh, viral Twitter thing when we beat the Celtics, the hot Fournier game from a couple years ago. I was at that game. That was <laughs> magical, but it's tough when that's all you have to cheer about. But hey, we'll get behind anything. We're, we're a fired up fan base. So, yeah, I have thoughts on the Super Bowl. Look, I, I wanted the Niners to win just because I, I thought. Th- the, the Purdy story was kind of cool, but I, the Chiefs are incredible. Mahomes is unbelievable. Uh, you know, the Kelsey push was a little, I mean, you're not supposed to push a geriatric, in my opinion. I don't think that's uh, very classy to push a guy who's overweight and old. You don't, you don't do that, you know, and when you're a superhero athlete, it's kind of, uh, but you know, Sam, Sam, the if, if if Andy Reid had fallen down and had difficulty getting up, it'd be a much bigger yeah. controversy. It'd be a life alert commercial. <laughs> <laughs> Are you kidding me? It was terrible. <laughs> He's uh, right. Yeah, I mean, no, it was a bad move. I, I also crack up at the people who are like obsessed with the Travis Kelsey, uh, Taylor Swift, that them together are some sort of uh, you know, s- spy for Joe Biden to get him elected. To, to those people, I say, well, then maybe you need to orchestrate your own Republican spies to to battle them with your celebrities. Maybe get Kanye to date Caitlyn Jenner. They could team up. <laughs> Something like that. I don't know. But it's an absurd. It's, it's insane. Like they're there's look, they're both famous people. She's a, a, a beautiful, famous pop star. And he's a handsome football player. Like, what do you expect? Same time tomorrow is the Netflix special. You should check it out because he's one of the funniest men doing it. You can get tickets for Irvine, Salt Lake City, Boston at sammorell.com. Anything else we need to promo for you? We appreciate your time, and we're going to wear you out as Nick's correspondent. going to be a hit in Boston. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I, Boston, they know. They know what's up. They know I love the Knicks. But, uh, look, Boston, I'm taping there for a reason. Some of the best comedy crowds in, uh, in the country. So I love the Wilbur. So I'm taping my next special for amazon there so that's going to be a a fun uh couple nights love boston people don't like their sports teams how uh, how many shirts like that do you have how much nick's paraphernalia do you too have? much 
Yeah. Too much, dude. It's not good. It's not healthy how much of this I have. But I look, I'm you can even see it, the, the Brunson face. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Does uh does love, your love does, Jalen. does your significant other or other loved ones mock uh how much you love the Knicks and how much teenage gear you have that you're an overgrown adolescent wearing so much Knicks stuff? I mean, uh would you mock uh, a, a John Starks jersey from when I was 11 years old. I don't think so. I think it's pretty cool, actually, Dan. Thanks for asking. But uh, <laughs> you have a 20- I think my next merch is pretty cool. <laughs> the last time you, we worked. You, cool. you have a 27 year old t shirt in your collection? I have so much old Nick stuff. Yeah, I kept all of it, man. I got old Starks. I got, uh, geez, I gave away my Larry Johnson jersey to a friend. I shouldn't have done it. It was, it was a, it was, I'm too generous. Uh, what else? Uh, I have, yeah, I have a ton of, my brother's got Ewing, the old Ewing, the, you know, we got, we shared a Mason, uh, <laughs> RIP, the great Anthony Mason, and then I got a Spreewell. So, uh, Randall was my first Knicks jersey in 20 years, I think, because, Makes you sense. know, there wasn't, there wasn't a guy I wanted to get behind, but that four seed year was pretty uh, unique, and I mean, I don't really wear jerseys, it was more just like, I just got to support the team, you know? Do you know how much it's going to hurt when the Heat eliminate you and you're wearing a Randall jersey? Uh, I just told you I don't really wear jerseys, so already your prediction doesn't make any sense. <laughs> well, yeah, but you said you, ju- you, sounds... sa- you said you had a rant. You said you had something yeah, Randall-related. Yeah. I don't wear it. I wear cool graphic tees made by this guy, I think, uh, Bacher Backpages. That's who makes these. He's great. He makes crazy cool ones. I got a, a Villanova, good like good villas. It's like uh, good fellas, but good villas. It's got the Villanova guys Stugans, on it. If if the Knicks are a three seed, you yeah. tell me that this guy's not going to be we- figure out how to wear Randall gear, and it's going to hurt extra when they lose in the second round. It's going to hurt because it hurts because we're never good. But he just said he doesn't wear okay. the jersey. He just buys the jersey. That's it. I believe that New York's about to get very loud because they believe in well. this team and they don't learn anything about their past. <laughs> it's you know how well, dangerous it is to believe in this team. You know, the Cubs had a drought, too, and that that ended. So I think droughts end, and I think this team, something about Brunson just makes me believe, man. We got a tough, gritty team. So Josh Hart, OG Ananobi, Mitchell Robinson. We got some physical guys for the playoffs, and I'm I'm feeling good. I'm feeling pretty good about this team. Are we going to win it all this year? It Who took, knows? It took but, the Cubs uh, 100, 108 yeah. years. You got about 50 more years to wait. I'm very healthy. I had an egg white omelet today. I could I could wait. Uh, I could wait forever. I'll be there whenever it happens. <laughs> Sam, good talking to you. Good seeing you again. Good talking to you guys. Go Ed Malloy! Is anyone surprised that both of the streakers in the Super Bowl who were caught, including Mike Ryan, that both of them were from Miami? Both streakers <laughs> in the Super Bowl uh, went to what? Las Vegas. You're surprised by that? I ju- I'm just finding out for the first time. Yes, uh, that, that there were two of them. There were two streakers, including one who looked like a shirtless Mike Ryan. Not surprising. I'd be surprised if they weren't from Miami. Yeah, okay, mm-hmm. uh, because uh, both of them somehow. And that seems like a really unpleasant night that's not worth it. It seems like an assortment <laughs> of bad judgments that result in your life being, uh, you know, not just your freedom taken away for the evening, but I'm guessing it ruins that night and several other days and paperwork and everything else. It doesn't seem, the, the cry for attention doesn't <laughs> seem in any way worth it, especially since uh, most people don't uh, televise this anymore. Television has figured out a way not to reward this behavior. But I ask you guys, not understanding what it is that young people do in exchange for attention, Stugatz, because all the time on social media, I'm mortified by somebody who's standing at the edge of a cliff for a photograph when they can fall off that cliff. And many people do to get the photo that they want to show everybody. Doesn't seem worth it. Well, but this, you tell me if it's worth it in the modern economy of attention is the only currency that matters. A shirtless Mike Ryan has forever the photos of him being handcuffed and dragged off the field. Is it worth it, whatever the inconvenience is? Because there's a cost. That that costs thousands of dollars. Whatever it is, the penalties, the lawyers, the bond, all of that stuff is very expensive. Plus, as you pointed out, the paperwork. All of it. Just all of it. You have to go. Yeah, you say the you say the paperwork. You can make fun of me, but there's a bureaucracy involved with what you're going to be inconvenienced by doing that. That I don't think a streaker considers before doing. That. I understand that. Just the detail I'm not concerned about is the paperwork. It's annoying. <laughs> I don't. You ask Mike how annoying was the paperwork. One of my greatest fears is having to do totally a bunch of paperwork. Surprise. Yeah, I did not know that when I was being processed. 
it took paperwork. Uh. Stugatz mocks this, and yet I know Stugatz is the first one complaining anytime he makes a doctor's appointment that he has to fill out a, a form. I hate it, but I'm just saying I'm drunk. I'm at the Super Bowl. I'm thinking about streaking. I'm weighing the positives and the negatives. Never will paperwork come into my mind. I mean. It's always the same form, too, right? You go back to the same oh, doctor's Jesus, office I every time, and they make times. you fill out the uh, right. My pharmacy hasn't changed. It's still that same Walgreens. Please stop asking me to fill this out and look up their address every freaking time I come in. In here my god uh, i know stugat you're mocking the idea that i'm thinking about paperwork with nude streaking <laughs> at a super bowl but i'm telling you it's one of the greatest inconveniences i consider I it. <laughs> when i'm like i don't want to get arrested in this situation what is worse i'm going to lose my freedom for a while but i'm not going to have to fill out paperwork or as part of the loss of my freedom you're going to make me fill out paperwork because if you want to jail me to avoid the paperwork i might choose that as an option okay <laughs> that's how badly i don't want to partake in paperwork all right, I got it. Don't do your taxes, then. I mean, this is very simple. I don't. Do your what? Oh. I have others do them. Stugatz doesn't even have others do them. <laughs> Paperwork. Let me ask everybody here a question, because this is something that happened a couple of days ago, and I immediately thought it was staged. I don't know if it is actually staged or not. But on Howie Mandel's podcast, I love that I'm saying that. Hmm. I love that everyone has a podcast. I love that his podcast has a cat behind him wearing a hat for some reason. Mm. Howie Mandel, famed germaphobe, has a podcast that evidently is very popular. And Dana White came on it. And Howie Mandel was effusive in his praise. And then Dana White did something that was strange. Not only an amazing businessman, you are an inspiration, you are a philosopher. The way you do business, the way you uh, conduct your business and your friendships and media is, uh, I'm, I'm jealous. And But Dana, I can't thank you enough for being here. And thank you for all the kind words. I appreciate it. I, I am so f***ing tired of doing podcasts. It's I, I'm literally done with them. I'm not doing any more podcasts. Dana walks out. Comedically perfect. <laughs> Don't know if it was intentional or not. Think it's funny the way that it is. Don't understand it. Think it's staged. But the awkwardness at the end is so well executed by the actors involved that it makes me wonder if this is just them confused <laughs> as we are by why you would walk away from what is effusive praise when you are just a promoter who's a carnival barker who is soaked in compliments at all times and somehow got away with slapping his wife in public without any consequences. So burdened by compliments that he walks off. Tell me, is it staged or is it real? Somebody. So he, I saw this pop up on my timeline a couple of days removed from him appearing on Pat McAfee, where he said, this is the only type of show like this that I do. I only do podcasts. I love podcasts because I don't like to deal with media because um, they, they try to get you, which I think in Dana speak is hold you accountable. Uh, he doesn't like that about media, at, you know, prying and holding him accountable. So he appears on podcasts and he was putting over p the notion of podcasts. And this lines up in direct opposition of a take that I heard last week on Pat McAfee's show, which leads me to believe possibly staged. But the performances are so good in this that, you know what, you got me if you're acting, <laughs> including Dana, by the way, because yeah. I've seen Dana try to act before. Yeah. And you could see as Howie Mandel is complimenting him. This notion of him not wanting to be there is washing over his face. Right. He is conveying that. That is great acting, if it, if it is indeed acting. Uh, I don't know what's real and what's not real anymore. And I'm tired of trying to figure it out. I really am. I have no idea if that's staged or not. It appears to me to be staged. Why would you walk out then? He's not criticizing you. He is promoting you. One of the best television shows I have seen recently, it's on what used to be Showtime. It's The Curse. And Christopher Nolan has says it's unlike any television he's ever seen before. And he's right. It's all awkward. And it's wonderfully awkward. And it's funny awkward. Can you guys play that for me again just so that we can get the last 10 seconds? Because the 
last 10 seconds of Awkward visually is where the gold is because Awkward is wildly funny. I'm recommending to all of you The Curse, okay? It's Nathan Fielder, and it's unlike anything I've seen on television. It just sinks into all the awkward. Watch this at the end. Not only an amazing businessman, you are an inspiration, you are a philosopher. The way you do business, the way you uh, conduct your business and your friendships and media is, uh, I'm, I'm jealous. And But Dana, I can't thank you enough for being here. And thank you for all the kind words, I appreciate it. I, I am so f***ing tired of doing podcasts. It's I, I'm literally done with them. I'm not doing any more podcasts. <laughs> look, it's comedy. It can't get funnier than that. <laughs> I think that's real. If 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 they if this was a put on, like you got me, it's really good. The 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 performances. If if this is a fake, what level of power and privilege have you arrived at when someone is calling you an inspiration, a philosopher? They're jealous of you. They love you as a businessman, as a friend, and it makes you storm off. <laughs> If you feel like it's disingenuous, which I don't think it is from Howie. If you've had a week, I don't know when he recorded this. It could have been Super Bowl week in Las Vegas, and he's just genuinely tired of he doing anything. Done. Tired of overwhelming praise. I would maintain right that there's no greater feeling in sports, all sports, than when you are playing foosball and you know you got an open shot at the goal and you spin you know, you do this, the, the pull on spin. It's kind of like the equivalent of like a like a forehand slam. Feels so, and then she goes Wah! rockets across the table. Oh, it's been you too long. Done that, Dan? I do. I do love the the foosball, the just whipping it as fast as you can. Right. Yes. The, when, when you got a straight shot, when you see that opening, and 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 you just go. Whoosh. But I'm I'm also someone who misses a lot with that, and so it's like the golfer who misses with this swing that he thinks the ball is going to go. It's a tricky game. Yards. Yeah. yeah. You but can bend it like worst, Beckham, though. I mean, I can. The worst is when you do like it Beckham. and it backfires. And it comes right back into your own goal. I hate that one in air hockey. Hubris. That, that uh, happens yes. to me all the time in air hockey where I <laughs> yes. score on myself because I'm sending a it rock. Comes back too yes, fast. Come right. back too fast. And then that sound haunts me. The sound of it clacking in your own goal. Yeah. Uh, Mina, it's, it's nice to see you. It is always nice to see you. We have a lot of football to discuss with you. But before we discuss the football portion of this, I did see that uh, you um, – it's awkward. It's always awkward when you have a celebration marred by a shooting. Uh, yeah. how, how do you navigate in this America as someone who's uh, societally conscious? How do you navigate your love of football, your love of the celebration uh, – uh, your love of the Chiefs winning with, oh, we have to stop the celebration here to have the football players console kids who are dealing with the kind of tragedy that kids should never have to deal with at a time like this in this country. And yet they face it in this country more than they face it in any country. That was the, the note from the shooting and, and all the everything that happened around it that really like took my breath away is I, I saw a report. It was from Albert Beer about how the players were comforting the kids and he was saying, you know, they were great and he was complimenting that. And, you know, it's, um, that you, you, you want to praise them and it's wonderful, but oh my God, right. Just the revelation, just thinking about the kids being there, having to see it now the rest of their life, who knows how old they are, but having that trauma and carrying it with you. And obviously, um, so many instances of that. I, I, you asked me how I navigate. I, you know, I always wonder what is worth saying and what is worth commenting on because it not only feels futile, and I think a lot of us wrestle with that as public figures or just people, but um, it feels so repetitive and redundant to just complete keep saying it's the guns, it's the guns, it's the guns. Although some people won't even say that, won't use the word guns. We see all these statements that don't reference guns. Um, I never know what, whenever I face like an, like a real story inter like intersecting with football that goes outside the field, I always ask myself, well, what can I actually add to this? And as I was thinking through, I was like, I don't feel like I have a lot to add I, beyond not being an expert. 
I, I, I question always, what, what can I say that's even additive or helpful? Um, the only thing I felt was worth my time was just sharing the same information that I've shared before about the guns, about the fact that America has, you know, 26 times more gun homicides in other high income countries that I shared an article that, um, examines the connection between the prevalence of guns in this country and gun violence. It, it, but at this point, you can't help but feel like, well, you're kind of banging your head into a wall, right? Because if you're ignoring the facts at this point, the facts have been out there, the facts get repeated every time this happens. So I guess you just have to keep doing that. You have to keep, even though it feels like you're banging your head into a wall, you have to keep sharing that information. You have to keep saying the word guns. You have to keep calling out public figures because what else can we do at this point? I will tell the audience, like we did earlier in the show, theshotline.org, if you want to feel slightly less helpless today, theshotline.org is a couple of easy steps to have uh, AI voices of victims and demand action as well to see if this can be slightly more moving to places in uh, to people in places where maybe it doesn't reach them. But I ask you this question before we move on to the silliness, Mina. Does any of you feel differently today experiencing this now that you're a mother than you did two or three or four years ago because I do think the horror that can reach anyone listening to this whether you have kids or not is that everyone can be united in the consensus of we shouldn't be slaughtering children hard stop but these are sacred places so I'm certain Mina has changed her viewpoint on this because Dan we're talking about parades we're talking about schools. We're talking about movie theaters. We're talking about all the places, Mina, that you would send your kids. Yeah, it absolutely changes how I take this story, which doesn't mean that it can't hit you just as hard if you don't you know, have a child or you don't have that um, someone in your life who is vulnerable and you want to protect them and your whole life is spent thinking about how to protect them now. And it, what a story like this drives home that it didn't for me before is that because of the circumstances of where we live, the fact that we live in a place where so many people have accepted those circumstances, um, where you know that our public officials accept those circumstances and are supported by people in our country, um, you can't. And that's like a breathtaking thing to realize. And it's so scary. And my kid, you know, he's home. He He's five months old. He's in my house. I see him most of the day. Uh, but thinking about my first thought was like, wow, will I feel comfortable taking him to public places? But then there also is the thought of, well, but then there's going to be half of the day at some point, he's going to be separated from me. Uh, and we do all of these things to protect him. I always spend time, so much time agonizing. Am I feeding him the right food? Am I giving him the right, you know, uh, toys, I don't know, educational toys or whatever. And that realization that you, you not only don't have control, and of course that's true of anywhere, but that lack of control, that risk is exacerbated because of where we live. It's, it's just shocking. It, I, I hadn't thought of it before. And I, it, you hold that in your heart now every time you say goodbye, every time they walk out the door. Stu's not, I mean, Stu has, you know, I just can't believe that we're all so accepting of that. Not we are all, but that as a country, we've accepted that level of risk when it comes to, you know, the people who are the most vulnerable. So this is an awkward flailing transition into the <laughs> football topics of the day. I haven't figured out how to do this one yet. Pro. I mean, uh, no, I have not pro. figured out how to do this one yet because I don't know. I, I know I was talking to Nick Wright. Nick Wright, this is a pretty fun time for Nick Wright. But this is his city. It's the city he cares about. And and he has kids and he's running away from a celebration where he's hugging Travis Kelsey. He's in the middle of the celebration and he yeah. feels the need to nail the moment right now in terms of social commentary on behalf of being a person with a microphone talking about the important things that need to be talked about. I don't know how uh, this next year is going to play out, uh, Mina, but I also don't know how you jump back and forth between let me talk about 
Kelsey bumping Andy Reid. Let me talk about what a fool Shanahan is. And also let me talk about gun violence in America because it's out of control in a way that's no longer acceptable to anybody. But isn't that the uh, tension that everyone is living with now in our country? Like, it, it's one thing for us to say, OK, you know, professionally, we're having to make these transitions. You're going to about to ask me about Kaja Hannah and Steve Wilkes or whatever. And I have to hold multiple thoughts in my head at once. But again, like everybody, regardless of whether you have a microphone in your face, had to hold those thoughts at once yesterday when they went about their days, when they saw the news, absorbed the news, probably hit up their friends and said, wow, this sucks. Nothing's happening. And then went back to work. It's just we're constantly now living in this state where we have to constantly live with that fear, that risk, and then go about our lives. It's not just us. Don't you become numb, though? Isn't the danger that the helplessness and the inactivity and no matter what you do, nothing changes. Isn't the danger that you become numb to the lack of humanity in all of it? That you just if it's happening one and a half times a day somewhere and if it's happening more here than it's happening everywhere else and we keep yelling about it and nothing changes, I don't know how you don't become, you don't become numb to your helplessness. I think that's the choice you have to make is I, 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 for us people who have platforms is, okay, do I really want to share this same article and say the same things when it feels like nothing's changing? It feels like it's not reaching anyone. And you have to make that tiny bet that maybe 2% of the people who see this, it didn't, didn't know the facts, didn't, weren't aware of the disparity, um, you know, between this country and other high income countries, perhaps didn't know about the connection between the, the the very demonstrable proven connection statistically between the prevalence of guns and gun violence. Or maybe they already did. There are they it's somebody who was concerned about control control, but wasn't armed with those sorts of statistics when they have that conversation with other people in their lives. You have to just keep doing it, even though it does feel futile and repetitive. And I think there's also something about the normalization of continuing to speak out, you know, um, even if it doesn't feel like it, it changes anything, the more people who just do it every time and continue to do it and continue to point to the statistics and continue to decry the inaction of public officials, um, that's ultimately how change comes about, even though it feels like it's never going to happen and it's taking forever. I will tell the audience again, theshotline.org. Uh, Mina, will come back with you after this. All right, Mina, let's transition into the playground silliness of what was most theatrically interesting to you. What was the football <laughs> stuff that was most interesting to you? What of Greg? Uh, what of Stugatz's classification of Kyle Shanahan? That's a fireable offense. You got to know the rules. Get out of here, Kyle Shanahan. You should be fired. You can't. People can't let up on Kyle Shanahan. He deserves. Yeah. He deserves to be buried for costing his team the Super he Bowl. He gets rid of Steve Wilkes today. Oh, Wilksy. I mean, what is going on? I accept some responsibility for what happened in that game. You didn't know the rules. You you think he did? No. I don't, I don't think he knew the overtime uh, rules. Uh, no, because I, think, I, I do th mean, I think he's a smart coach. And if he knew the rules, yeah. he would have known to go for it on fourth down because you don't give Patrick Mahomes okay. a chance to march down the field and beat Look, you. Did, mean, he, did he know actually, the rules or did he understand the rules? Like what? There there might be a difference there. Stu, you seem to have, you kind of, I don't know if you backed into it or if you, you're you actually, you, this was intentional, but you actually, that to me is um, a more nuanced criticism than the one that, I've been hearing more, which is oh, how dare he not take the ball second. So you have the opportunity to, you have the information you, you mentioned that he didn't go for it. Um, and I, I haven't seen that criticism that much. I actually think that is a, um, perhaps a, a better and more interesting critique that they kicked the field goal there on, on uh, fourth down when they had the ball, because if you go for it there, uh, yes, it's possible that you don't, uh, convert, but you also, if you don't convert, you pin the chief. They were all the way yes. uh, near the goal line. And yep. I actually thought that that's something I haven't seen many people suggesting that Shanahan should have done that. I was actually surprised when Shanahan went for it on fourth down during regulation, because he's a very conservative coach. This has long been my frustration with him. I think he's an absolutely brilliant play caller. I think he makes a lot of mistakes as a game manager. 
Um, and ultimately, I think, you know, I, you could argue that 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 came to haunt him, not just in overtime with his approach, but at the end of the first half, didn't take a timeout, cost a team an extra possession. I've seen him do that a million times. It's crazy. Like, he's the most creative, smart, best at sequencing play caller in the NFL, and yet seems to have, like, an inability in his own play calling when it comes to offensive aggression, and it drives me nuts. Moreover, the reason to actually kick there and not receive because it takes some of the guesswork out of it. You know exactly what the scenario is if you have the ball second, which is another shocking reason. And you're saying wholeheartedly he knew the rules. Understanding well, is something yeah. different. The players very clearly didn't. And there was a difference there outside of the guy who caught the game winning touchdown who said he didn't know if he won. Uh, the, the important players on that Kansas City offense said that this was something that was drilled into them. We have not. I think given enough attention to the fact that we were robbed of w what could have been one of the funniest moments in the history of Super Bowls, which is if the 49ers had scored and they all thought they would have won. <laughs> like, have we got, Walk like, off? <laughs> yes. The, 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 we saw that the players didn't know if they had scored, they would have gone ballistic. We might have had guys like running onto the field celebrating. <laughs> Getting penalties, getting, getting penalties, pe like, giving, giving Mahomes 15 yards <laughs> oh, because you would, you he had the seen, ball, the one. I have a feeling you would have seen Kyle Shanahan celebrate too. <laughs> Stop it. Um, the only thing is interesting, guys. You know, when they changed the rules after the uh, the Chiefs Bills game, um, I, I talked to a lot of folks around the NFL because I was curious. Like, my initial thought was you take the ball second so you have information. I by the way, the Stugats is not strong in me. I tweeted that at the beginning. You can go look at the timestamp at the beginning of overtime. So uh, it wasn't Monday, Monday, Monday morning quarterbacking on my part. But I was surprised by a lot. A lot of folks around the NFL um, were like, eh, you can actually make a case for it either way, because as Shanahan alluded to, the advantage you get if you have the third possession when it goes to sudden death. Um, and then, you know, you give your defense a break as well. Uh, I suspect, though, moving forward, we'll probably see more teams take the ball second. You know, we had so little, in, there's so little, inf this is the first time it ever happened. Nobody really had the information to work off of. And you can say, well, how do you do that when Kyle or when Patrick Mahomes is on the other side? Totally get that. But you could also argue that, uh, you know, he had a lot of faith in his own offense to score. Now, the Chiefs players said that they would have kicked, gone for two. I tend to believe them. So that to me might have been, uh, Shanahan's biggest miscalculation is not believing the other team would be more aggressive than him and go for two. Mina, you got an awful lot right. You told us, you warned us that Kansas City would be some semblance of fine. You also yeah. told us that everyone you talked to told you that McCaffrey would have that game. What I hadn't accounted for is that Kansas City would allow McCaffrey to have that game in exchange for Debo's not going to get anything, Kittle's not going to get anything, and Ayuk's not going to get anything. I didn't think that was possible. I'm used to every time I look yeah. up, Purdy's getting 300 yards because Debo and Ayuk have 110 of them. Yeah. I The week of the Super Bowl, uh, I at, in Radio Row, I had – Miles Garrett and Denzel Ward on my YouTube channel. And I asked them, like, what did you guys do? Because the Browns gave the Niners a really hard time. And I think that was a bad way. That was a bad, it definitely was a bad weather game. But both of them said, we just were like, you know what? We're going to go down fighting and play man coverage. And we're, you know, we're going to win with the pass rush and, and bat balls because it's a smaller quarterback. But the, the man, we're going to, we're going to play sticky man coverage because we have the personnel to do so. And I think I underestimated the ability of the Chiefs secondary to do that as well. I mean, re-watching the coverage was outstanding. Trent McDuffie, Legereus Need. I mean, they had Debo in an absolute chokehold in this game, uh, just so physical at the line of scrimmage, and it really disrupted the Niners' offense, to their credit. Uh, that and the fact that, like, you know, with the blitzes, a lot, obviously tons and tons of unblocked pressures. That was interesting to rewatch too, because every time – it wasn't like one thing like, oh, Brock Purdy is screwing up or the Niners offensive line is screwing up or George Kittle is screwing up in pass protection, which is how you get Trent McDuffie. It was always a different thing, but it felt like Steve Spagnuolo was a step ahead when it came to his pressures versus what the 49ers were doing in pass protection. 
How are we to regard the Kansas City Chiefs defense historically? Because I was saying yesterday that if you have Mahomes, you're not allowed to ever be remembered as one of the best defenses ever. But what they just did to four <laughs> elite offenses is unlike anything I've seen a defense do, especially in the second half. It's so unfair. I mean, I, I don't think yeah. this will be regarded as a historically great defense. And the only reason it won't be is because Mahomes is their quarterback. I disagree. I think people will remember this as a defensive Super Bowl. Um, you know, I think back to the uh, the thirteen to three Patriots Rams Super Bowl. Um, I think most of us remember that about as being like Tom Brady, like Patrick Mahomes. He had that incredible final drive with Rob Gronkowski. You remember to to win the game. But when we look back at that Super Bowl, like when I do the Brady Belichick chart, that one goes under Belichick for me. Um, and I think with Mahomes, we're at a point now where there have been so many Super Bowls. I suspect there will be so many Super Bowls that we will be able to do that as well. And we will look back at this year as very much being about the defense. We will also look at it as though as the year that Patrick Mahomes dragged potentially the worst group of skill players he'll ever have to the Super Bowl. But, you know, I think both things can be true. I'm just looking at that game that's going to be remembered as the Mahomes game, and I'm going to ask you, how many touchdown, long touchdown drives did he have in that game? Only the one that mattered, right? Right. It yeah. Was, it was when it mattered most. Yes. <laughs> it it <laughs> really is like the Patriots-Rams Super Bowl yep. in that way. It should have been longer if Shanahan knew the rules. I mean. <laughs> what did you think of the Kelsey bumping a Reed situation? Because I'm maintaining that if Andy Reed had gone down and had trouble getting up, America would show a great deal of concern for how violent a gesture that was. Or if was. Travis Kelsey were just black. I think um, Taylor Swift internet did show some concern in the moment. I don't know. Maybe I'm just getting served uh, some of the like deep Taylor Swift accounts by the algorithms, but they're like, is he too violent? Like Taylor Swift, like they're because they are very much worried at all times about whether or not he's right for her or any partner is right for her. And I did see a lot of breakdowns of that moment saying, whoa, 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 we got to watch out for uh, Travis Kelsey here. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's that's a moment, Dan, where if they if the Chiefs had lost, it would have been run back a lot more. And this is always the case with football, right? Winning erases everything. Mm -hmm. Mina, I want to know what your thoughts are on Steve Wilkes being fired because it seemed like yeah. there was going to be a drop off with the defense no matter what this year after D'Amico Ryan's left and he feels like he's getting a, a bit of a scapegoat treatment even though I know there, there were struggles throughout the season and at the same time Shanahan did want him to run like the system that they had in place last year so how much do you really blame him? I think this is really this is really interesting it's really complicated because if the Niners had not gone to the Super Bowl, I don't think a soul on earth would have been surprised if Steve Wilkes was fired after the performance we saw from that defense against the Packers and the Lions, right? But then they played so well in the Super Bowl that if it, it, and that's our last memory of this defense and this football team, it feels like scapegoating. It's it's like, what, what the heck? The offense didn't come up. The defense did their part in the Super Bowl. And I think that's the problem is we're kind of looking at it through the lens of the Super Bowl. Um, my, my take on sort of his role in that defense, which was still good during the regular season, but they weren't as good struggled in run defense is it, it, well, for a while. We've been talking about the Niners, um, losing all these coaches, right? Yeah, like Kyle Shanahan didn't want to lose Domingo Ryan. Domingo Ryan became a head coach, obviously. Um, but there's kind of a brain drain with that. And, the sense I got from this team, they, and they've lost a ton of coaches on both offense and defense. The sense I got with this team is that they they had a very specific identity on defense. Um, D'Amico Ryans was a brilliant coordinator who you know executed that identity, and they brought in Wilkes, who had a specific system, a little bit more aggressive, a little bit more blitzing for a lot more blitzing actually. For example, and Shanahan said, "Okay, well, keep 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 this thing going. We we know what we do on defense. We have the players." And that there was some conflict throughout the season between his vision, D'Amico Ryan's vision, and Steve Wilkes' vision. And I think what we're seeing now is the result of that conflict, the result of some of the performances during the regular season. But it feels wrong because the last time we saw the defense, they played so well. 
We've got less than 90 seconds left. I will remind people it's an extraordinary podcast. The Mina Kimes Show featuring Lenny is something you should find on YouTube and in just its audio form. But uh, Mike Ryan has a multiple choice question for you, and you're only allowed to pick one answer here. One of three. Wow. Okay. Most important reason the Kansas City Chiefs are Super Bowl champions, aside from Patrick Mahomes, is possibly the greatest. Dre Greenlaw tears his Achilles running onto the field uh, earlier in that game. Leo Chennault grades out to be Pro Football Focus's most impactful player in that game. Or Kyle Shanahan decides to get the ball first. Huh. I choose D, government psyop. Hmm. I'm sorry, D was actually Trent McDuffie. Oh. <laughs> Greenlaw's injury was kind of important, though. They were all, yeah, they went after his, his uh, replacement. They, I mean... I would probably go with um, Chris Jones had some pretty impactful moments. They don't win without Chris Jones, so I'll go with Chris Jones. Including, Mina, on the the third. If they, it would have never come down to the fourth down if Purdy had made the correct read on third and It wasn't and an fourth. option either, Mina. That wasn't an option. Pick one That's of the, right. That right. wasn't one of the options. Option. You went off the board. You went off yeah. the board. Now yeah. we're out of time, Mina. The answer is Kyle Shanahan very clearly yes, should have that's the answer. kicked the ball. Come we on. glossed over something that Mina said earlier. I'm very excited about this. She has a Brady-Belichick chart where she assigns who was the reason they won specific Super Bowls. I want to see that chart next week, okay? The entire I'll show chart. it to you. Okay, it's more you. Brady, but Belichick's right behind him. <laughs> it's um, not. Mina, excited to do this, uh, the offseason, to talk less football with you and more life. We'll, well talk the, to you next the week. The deal expired, so no, you won't. See you later. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go, Thursday Thunder. We are here. What was that sound to start? What was that sound? How, what did you start that with? What sound did you start that with? It's the very pod was loud. A hot. Yeah, it's we're very just, loud. You know, yes, Dan, we're getting right. our bearings here. Yeah. It's thundering out. Like you know, there's a lot of rain. But what was the sound you made at the beginning of this that made everyone drop their head into their hands because you started this so poorly? That's because I said something with my mic on. There's a lot of blue lights over here, and sometimes right. you forget which one's which. What'd you say though? I mean, I don't remember what I said. Thursday Thunder is sponsored by DraftKings. Stay tuned, and you'll hear more about DraftKings and all it has to have offered throughout the show. DraftKings, the crown is yours. We're going to do Thursday Thunder, guys. <laughs> I, mean, I love you. Guys you. Where, where's your confidence at right now? Not great. In Vegas. It's just sometimes there's music playing, and I'm like, I got to turn it down, and I got to talk. should still probably turn it down a little bit. Yeah. It's still hot. Lucy, I got it. It's pretty right. loud. <laughs> Happy to help. All right. Thursday Thunder, we're going to do over. I don't I don't feel like you were. Otherwise you, didn't have you to would have lash out at Lucy. Otherwise, you would have. She might the people she needed to. I'm just a girl, Chris. I'm just a girl trying to do my job. Badly. O- over 12 and a half rebounds <laughs> for Giannis Antetokounmpo and Rudy Gobert. Those are the first two legs of our Thursday Thunder. We like rebounds around here. You have a lot of missed shots in the uh, game. A lot of missed shots, a lot of boards, a lot of things to eat up for those guys. We also like the no, under. No thunder in between? or The under. Oh, does oh, oh he's literally you over your shoulder. You can't have the teacher over the shoulder. Over the you shoulder. Can't do that, Mike. Right over the shoulder telling you when to hit the thunder. Trying to be helpful. Let him put his own spin on the show. Yep. No, he's he's owning it. Under 19 and a half points, Jonathan Kaminga. That's a real person. <laughs> of course it is. It's an important person He's to the good. Warriors. Yeah. Yes. Of course. Right. That's what I'm telling you. Under 19 and a half points. That's our Thursday But Thunder. you're betting against him because you don't think Kaminga can score more than well, 19 and a half points. Camera crew, Kaminga all over Stugatz right now. <laughs> he does have a little, uh, a little on his face from earlier. <laughs> what? What? Let me. Do we do all the? Yeah, we cool. did all three of them. Right? Two, two legs and a Kaminga. That's why I needed right. the thunder. Yes, the you thunder can't helps. be a fan when you say that guy Kaminga. <laughs> it's offensive, and you show your ignorance. I mean, it's like that guy Hart. It's the same thing, but it's why Sam Morell is mad at Stephen A. Smith for reducing him to that guy Hartenstein. <laughs> you do a weird thing with Hartenstein. No, that's how you pronounce it. I've heard the broadcasters <laughs> yeah. pronounce it that way. He's that's saying Hartenstein. Sam was. You're I, saying Hartenstein. The, the broadcast. It's a sh-
It's a Stein. You gotta watch League Pass, too. Yeah, but some people say Hart and Steen, Stephen A. It's I a. will say, shout out to League Pass, by the way. You get all the in, in arena, in stadium entertainment on League Pass, and I know that people know this by now, but it never ceases to amaze me when you get to watch like a local band do the national anthem or like some weird uh, thing during halftime. Somebody on a is... bicycle th- uh, kicking plates onto well, her Red head. Well, Red she's a legend, yeah. Mm-hmm. But yes, Dan, it is the absolute best part of the basketball's fine. Whatever, I'll watch the stupid Knicks. But the the in-stadium entertainment is really what tickles me. That and, and Clyde's outfits. I do believe there's a generational gulf there as well where Stan Van Gundy and Steve Kerr uh, both hate uh, the the in-game entertainment that is a bombardment <laughs> of stimuli at every turn at basketball games because they're like, shouldn't the game, shouldn't Hartenstein be enough? Why do I need a T-shirt cannon of any sort? Why can't I oh, just? I love the T-shirt cannon too. <laughs> Little parachutes come out of the sky. I love a kiss cam. I do. We're not doing those very much anymore. Oh yes, we Although are. I noticed MSG is. UM still does yeah. it for men's yeah. basketball. Yeah. My daughter gets really disappointed when she doesn't get a T-shirt, and like it's very disheartening to her. She's gotten a lot of T-shirts. We have courtside seats. Look at me, Louie, for the women's game. So usually they see how crestfallen she is because she legitimately cries when she doesn't get a t-shirt so she doesn't really understand the concept of going to a game and not being handed a t-shirt it's a very dangerous way to start things out (laughs) i love those moments though where you can just be like honey this is life i tried sometimes you don't get what you want i tried and then by the third go around i'm like just give her the shirt it's a, triple, it's, it's a triple xl just let her have it you'll tackle people i mean yeah. you'll box them Yo, out you'll do what you have to do yeah you're happy now she's crying my dad wouldn't say you can't not get what you want he would play the song by the stones that song gives me so much ptsd really so julie it. juliet is in a situation where not unlike the swifties who think you uh, arrive at football and immediately win the super bowl Juliet's uh, the way she's being formed in sports is you go to a sporting event and they give you a free T-shirt. That's yeah. her life. Yeah, like eighty percent of the time, you sit courtside and you get a free T-shirt. Yeah, twenty percent of the time that you don't, you cry, and then Daddy <laughs> buys you something afterwards to stop the crying. That's what we're teaching her, but we're also saying not too much time in the iPad as a babysitter because we want to have discipline. I as mean, we raise if, you, if you really want to look into it, it's probably not great that out the gates you got courtside seats too, kid. <laughs> this took Daddy a very long time. A child of privilege, she's going to be in sports because uh, my, she, my baby is spoiled. Uh, no, just to, to be clear, though, it's I not love her. It's not just that it's your okay, baby Mike. is spoiled. She goes. She thinks the sporting experience is not merely to sit courtside at the game and be handed a T-shirt, but also the players wave at you and interact with uh, yeah, you during the, the game. And they hug you and they they take you up for dunks afterwards. She's got a very skewed perception of all those things she thinks it's totally normal normal to go to disney once a month if you took her to a game and she sat 300 level how, how would she react oh come on i'm not saying 300 level <laughs> i don't even not not even to teach her a lesson will i subject myself to 300 apple level. Tree, since got, it's apple tree i want to play for the audience a little bit of video here that had the entire I mean, who does that help <laughs> Had the entire room uh, with goosebumps because I obviously am too old to be a gamer. Uh, Stugatz is too old to be a gamer. But EA Sports has put out its trailer, I guess, for a a college football game that we keep getting told is coming soon, is coming soon. Here's the trailer. Got something special for y'all. Little update for our fans from the big house to the bayou, from Carolina to California. Yeah, it's about college football. We know you love it. Us too. The rivalries, comebacks, the traditions and superstitions built by generations. There's nothing like it. Turns out, We've been building, too. So let's address the big owl in the room. Yeah, we've seen the posts, the predictions, the doubts. We get it. It's been a minute. Let's just say this ain't the only jersey we've been working on. The game this sport deserves. Because pretty soon, this place will be full again. 
Until then, cue the crowd noise. I'm about to fuck the portal so loud. <laughs> Do I still have to spend 30 minutes on a phone call? I only have nine hours in a day. I'm going to have the most corrupt college football team. Oh, you are. This side of the Mississippi. I'm warning you right now. When Akron makes it all the way to the top of the summit, I am breaking every rule. Oh, this is so great. We watched it out in that bullpen. This is my second time watching that now. And... Um, there were legit goosebumps everywhere in that newsroom because this game, it just means so much to people of a certain age. There are so many men 35 to 40 on my timeline right now losing their minds. You would have thought a new national album dropped. They've been waiting for how long? For Since this. 2014? We're still waiting, by the way. Yeah. I, right. I still have my doubts, all yeah. right? And they were like, we've seen the messages. Yeah, that's my message because this is something that's been teased for years. And because of all the legal headaches involved with making a video game based off of athletes who until recently weren't allowed to be paid based off their name, image, and likeness, <laughs> it has not existed. And they were like, oh, it's coming, it's coming. When? When? Well, you say July, but I'll believe it when July. I see it. Well, they 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 actually use that doubt in this teaser trailer um, with all the which I'll indicates it pretty clearly it. that it will come out in July. Now they don't you don't do this unless you don't make this commercial you unless. Bet? I, I mean, I don't know about it, Jim. So much about college sports can change between now and then. I mean, where is the Pac-12? There's no Pac-12. There's two teams that own the licensing to Pac-12. There's a lot that has to be figured out. We have to figure out a protocol for the college football playoff. Hell, FSU may successfully get out of the ACC. There is so many things that can change between now and then that part of the issue is that it's such a fluid situation that you'll almost have to – wow, you really do have to When's get When's the changing stop? It never changes. Never. I mean, never if stops. my players right. decide to unionize, right. I'm going to turn into David Samson so fast. <laughs>